Good morning, everyone. And it is uh, 11.03. I am Representative Eleni Cavros de Gras, and we are going to convene the public hearing for today, uh, March 3rd, 2023. Looks like my first speaker is not here today, Dr. Anwar. So Senator Summers, you are up now. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Senator Summers. I represent the 18th District in Eastern Connecticut. Um, and I am here to testify on two bills, uh, Senate Bill 506 and Senate Bill 5884. Uh, first on Senate Bill 506, there will definitely need to be some language changes. I don't think the intent of the bill really was reflected in the language. But this has to do with solar farms, especially in small rural areas. And Connecticut has uh, really encourage solar farms. Um, and one of the ways they do that is they exempt um, solar farms that are three megawatts and under. And many of our smaller towns, as you'll hear, uh, one of my selectmen is here to testify on this. They are in the in the process of, they don't have any say where the siting council puts the solar fam, uh, farms, first of all. And a lot of farms are leasing their land to allow solar to come onto uh, their property as a revenue source. So when the siting council cites, for example, a five megawatt solar farm, the municipality has an ability to tax the equipment. However, what's happening is you will hear if there is a 10 megawatt solar farm that's been cited by the siting council, what they turn and do to the municipality is say, oh no, it's not a 10 megawatt. It's actually a two, 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 and a two thereby avoiding all property tax to the municipality. Some of our smaller towns um, do not have the avail availability to grow. They're farming communities. And again, they have no say over where these solar farms are put by the siting council. You can have intervening status, but that's very difficult. So the intent of this bill is if you are cited for a five megawatt uh, solar farm that you are going to be paying the property taxes on the equipment for a five megawatt solar farm. You would not be able to turn around to the municipality and say, oh no, it's not really five, it's a two, two and a one. They are contiguous, they are right next to each other and that's what's happening. So you will hear more from that from my first selectman from North Stonington, Bob Carlson, who'll be speaking in a probably the next five folks. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions on that. The next item that I wanted to testify on was um, HB 5884, which allows for fire districts to either become their own electric company or to look outside of the designated area if they are an Eversource uh, customer. The one thing I wanted to just get on the record here is although that may sound like a wonderful way to try to reduce energy costs, in fact, it's not really reality. The fire district, for example, would have to get approval from Pura. They would have to either bond or look with the local municipal cooperative to be able to purchase all the infrastructure in that area at market rate. So a fire district would have to take them upon themselves or get a municipal cooperative to do that. Again, bonding millions and millions of dollars for the infrastructure that's right there. And then uh, making it thereby, by the time you roll those costs in, making the electricity so expensive, it wouldn't be worth actually pursuing. Uh, the other thing is that is not really recognized in this bill is if a fire district chose to do that themselves, they would have to pay the annual cost of operating the system. They would have to have personnel equipment. They'd have to trim the trees. They'd be responsible for restoring power in a timely manner, trimming the trees and maintaining all the infrastructure and also coordinating the third party communications for pole attachments and jointly owned uh, poles within the area. So although this bill may be well intended, um, the reality of what it's trying to do um, it is not something that I think um, is actually possible at this point in time. So I didn't wanna give people a false hope that by passing this bill, your fire district would be able to just go choose a different municipal cooperative and you're gonna get the same rates that you would if you happen to live in one of those territories. So I wanted to make sure that that, that was on the record and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, thank you. Okay, uh, not seeing any in the room, but we do have Senator Fazio online. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for your testimony. Um, the the solar uh, property tax issue is also one we've um, seen discussed on um, energy and technology, although it, it really is a, a planning and development issue in this case. Um, can you can you talk more about you know, specific instances uh, you've seen uh, in, in this regard? Um, you know, both both here and on the Energy and Technology Committee, we all want to see uh, you know deployment of solar succeed. But um, you know, between the the issue of siting override uh, overriding any local uh, input and zoning. Uh, and then on top of that, the the, the special um, the special treatment and the sort of um, the arbitrage of the rules in order to avoid taxation. I, I can imagine that's um, that's an unfair situation for towns. Okay, so can you talk about kind of specific instances you've seen, uh, or any other uh, you know uh, you know, direct contact you've you you've seen on the issue? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for that question. It's kind of strange to look at you on the computer here. Um, but um, so in in you will hear directly from the first selectman, but it this is something that seems to be just starting. And again, I think you framed it really well in the fact that these towns, you know, they do not have say necessarily where solar farms are going. Um, it's very difficult to get intervening status to have the siting council not site a solar farm in your area. So if you have an area like North Stonington, uh, where we have a farmer who has hundreds of acres, but is leasing a certain amount of acreage to a solar farm uh, that has been sited to have a five megawatt um, solar farm. When it comes time for the assessor or the tax collector to tax, uh, get the income or the taxes on the property or the, the actual equipment that they're allowed to tax, uh, the this, this solar company, which is a subsidiary of a larger solar company, uh, turns to the town and says, well, this actually isn't a five. This is a two, two, and a one. Um, and we are selling two megawatts to one college, two megawatts to another college, and one megawatt somewhere else. That's very difficult to prove, number one, where they're actually selling the power. But um, secondly, if you're cited for a five megawatt, you are then in essence um, stripping the ability for a municipality to collect any um, taxes on the equipment. This is just one particular example. There is a 19 megawatt um, solar farm that is in the works in this town and we could certainly see the same thing happening where uh, the company who will own that solar farm can turn around and say oh no this isn't 19 this is three 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 two two and one so uh, i think this is a loophole that was an unintended consequence of a good idea trying to give tax uh, credits or no property tax on uh, these solar farms but the municipalities again they can't collect the property tax they don't have any say in where these are cited. And I don't think the intent of the law was to have these yeah. solar companies sort of subvert the idea of the towns being able to tax them on their equipment. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. And and, and I also take your point about um, we need to be um, uh, judicious about looking at language here and and, and uh, be very precise because uh, it's difficult. It's a difficult one, but your point's very well taken. Um, on the on the other bill of 5884 that you you testified on uh, you know just just to clarify uh, you know you described the kind of the the economic situation well I, I i suppose you you don't being that you do represent municipal fire districts you couldn't see foresee any case in which uh this would actually result in in joining or establishing a a municipal fire uh, a municipal electric utility uh, in these districts? Yes, I think that, um, you know, the, the intent of this bill m most likely is to try to help reduce energy costs. However, I don't think that it is practical in any way. Um, even if you pass this bill, allowing fire districts to create their own uh, municipal um, you know, energy cooperative, so to speak, or um, allow them to go outside of their already designated territory. Now, Connecticut was very um, particular in its franchise law and who has what territory in the state of Connecticut. So if a fire district was going to 
let's say um, in our area, and I happen to represent Groton Ut Utilities, and they have a very specific area within Groton, if someone from Mystic or the Mystic Fire District wanted to join um, Groton Utilities, it is unreasonable. The Mystic Fire District would have to either bond and be able to purchase all of the infrastructure from Eversource at market value to be able to deliver the energy to their fire district, along with all the annualized cost, all the tree trimming, all the personnel, they'd have to be able to respond to storms. Or the other option would be to ask the citizens of the city of Groton who own Groton Utilities, do you want to take on this new territory? That expansion for them would require, again, those citizens bearing the cost of the infrastructure, purchasing it from Eversource, if you could get it cleared through Pura, which is, I mean, it's we're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So does a fire district wanna take them on themselves or do they want to ask the Groton Utilities in this particular case for them to bear the brunt of that or that cost? They would have to go out and bond for that. And that would be rolled into their energy costs, which again, could very well make their energy costs higher than ever source. So, you know, in I, I understand the idea is how do we allow, um, you know, choice, we have choice now of deliveries, but if you are not in a municipal cooperative area, um, you don't get the benefit that people like me that have ever source, um, we don't get the benefit that you do for grant utilities, but it's not as easy as this bill tries to make it. And I think that there are other, other alternatives that they're looking at in the energy committee that could help to reduce the cost of energy, but this certainly is not the way to go. And so I just wanted to make sure that I had that on the record. I didn't want people who are looking at this bill to think that if this legislature passes this bill that, ooh, I live in a fire district, I can just go join Groton Utilities or Norwalk Utilities because it just doesn't work that way. And it's much more complicated. And I wanted to just get on the, the record that, um, you know, if this were to pass or if it was to get out of this committee, um, even if a fire district wanted to join something like Groton Utilities, I'm picking on that because it's my district, it wouldn't even be Groton Utilities fault if they did not want to service that area because the cost is just so prohibitive. So I just wanted to get that on the record here today. I hope that answers your question. Yes, so it does. Thank, thank you for your testimony, Senator. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, Representative Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Summers, for being here today and testifying. Um, just a question on uh, 506. Not knowing how many of these projects are already built, would you, and it's not in the bill, of course, yet, but would you consider doing something retroactive, too? So let's say there are projects that are already erected and are trying to use this loophole uh, for tax purposes, can you envision this looking back at those existing solar farms? That's actually a really good question. And I would say, yes, okay. I do not think that um, it would be um, <clears throat> the intent of the original legislation was, you know, three megawatts and under you don't pay property tax on the equipment. But if you are siting a solar farm for 10, that's what you went to the siting council for. And now you're trying to go to the local municipality. In many cases, these are the rural small towns. Um, you know, you're not getting big solar farms in the middle of a city. Uh, and then coming back and saying, oh, it's really not a 10. It's a, a two, 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 and a two. That to me sounds like a, a company trying to work around the law as written. So I think that, um, especially for these small towns, again, they don't have any say in where these solar farms are going. They cannot, I mean, they can intervene, but it's so costly and usually unsuccessful. Right. So, um, you know, the law allows them to tax uh, if it's over three megawatts. So I think that we should be, um, you know, this, this bill does need some language changes, but I think that we should be strident in the fact that that's what was intended. And uh, we should give the ability for these small towns to, um, if the 10 megawatt is cited in their their town, then they should be able to tax over the three megawatts. 
I, I agree. And I appreciate your testimony on that. And we are hearing HB 6293, which would actually give the municipalities, their locals, planning and zoning commissions, the ability to oversee and have a say in these. So um, I'm, I'm sure the siting council uh, wouldn't be happy with that. But I, I know, uh, obviously, as serving uh, on our local uh, council for many years, I think the the towns are are tasked with coming up with these plan of conservation developments, and often in those plans they cite where they would like to see these huge solar projects be placed. And um, unfortunately, the siting councils choose not to consider any of these these POCDs. So. Um, I, I support you on your uh, your bill here for 506, and I would love to see it retroactive. So thank you for testifying today. Thank you. And I would support that other bill. I think that's a great bill that you guys are taking a look at. And um, it is important, yeah. especially in the small towns, because they just don't have the ability to fight where they go or where they're placed. And, um, you know, it is significant revenue. You will hear from a first selectman that can talk to you about what the revenue loss would be if this continues. And it, I think it's frightening if we're citing large, large solar farms that can turn around and say, you know, it's a two, 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 two. It's not a 20. So um, I, I'm really happy that this committee is taking a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing oh, Representative Baumgartner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, uh, good to see you, Senator. Um, just a couple questions. Um, so that Earlier in your testimony, for um, you said you were supportive of um, SB 506. Um, and uh, I, I apologize. So you spoke on two bills um, in your public te testimony. So that's 506 and 5884. All right. And 506, um, you're supportive of? 506 is a bill that I put in concerning solar farms that we were just discussing. Yes. Um, it does need some tweaking to the language, but uh, the intent is what we have just discussed here previously. Yes, I apologize. I was coming from environment, um, and um, I, I would agree. Any time we can get uh, planning and zoning, uh, certainly uh, in the mix as well, um, to approve things in our community that um, otherwise uh, they wouldn't have the ability to opine on. I, I think that's important. Um, so thank you for for introducing that measure. And then uh, lastly, just on five eight eight four, which is my bill. Uh, as you know, I'm your representative, and you're my senator, so. Uh, we share territory, um, and I would note that there are uh, many ratepayers in uh, knowing, for example, that have their own fire district uh, that have been clamoring uh, to have choice, uh, to have competition. Uh, Eversource is a monopoly that, in my opinion, should be broken. Uh, others may agree with that here. Others may disagree. Um, but I think we need to take uh, drastic and significant steps to, to do just that. Uh, that's what uh, many residents within our towns are advocating for, uh, whether it's No Inc. or Mystic, that uh, do have their own fire district that are a part of the Eversource uh, service area. Uh, I live in Grot Utilities, um, and as, as you know, uh, we have um, some of the, and uh, have historically had the uh, lowest rates in the state of Connecticut. Um, that is um, uh, in no small part due to its governance structure, uh, that it is a local, municipal, publicly owned utility, not privatized, not owned by shareholders um, across uh, the country and the world. Uh, they live right here in our backyard, um, and therefore, when it pertains to uh, response, the reliability of our system, uh, everything is superior to whatever source could ever offer. And so, um, I would just hope that uh, you consider uh, some of the the, the constituents we both represent uh, in um, you know your regard for for this legislation. But um, my question is, you know, you had talked about uh, steps that would be taken to uh, you know, for a fire district to presumably take over uh, existing privatized electric an, an existing privatized electric service area. Um, where did you base this hundreds of million dollars off of, and what what information were you provided to make that assertion? Well, I, I first would like to just say that the local municipal cooperatives were um, enacted under this uh, legislature years ago to particularly be in in the nine most distressed communities. So they were located in communities that were the most distressed where they could deliver uh, the energy at uh, the lowest cost available. 
Um, and I agree that Groton Utilities, it's in the city of Groton, it, it happens to be in one of those areas. Um, if you're talking about the Noank Fire District, um, that is not a distressed community. That is a very wealthy dis, uh, fire district. And I agree, I would like to have more competition. There is other alternatives for the delivery of electricity besides Eversource that people have the ability to look at. And, uh, you know, I did set it previously before you came in, that I understand that this bill is to um, attempt to try to look at how we can reduce energy costs, but I don't think that this is a realistic way to do it. Because if you were to take Noank Village Fire District, for example, and say you have an opportunity to go with Brighton Utilities, uh, they would either have to bond for the infrastructure costs to be able to pay Eversource market rates to purchase that equipment to get the energy there. And then they would take on all the responsibilities that a regular uh, utility company has, trimming trees, personnel, storm response, or brought utilities would have to do that. Again, bonding, because when you look at the infrastructure costs and you add up the miles, it's it ends up being hundreds of millions of dollars, and I'm happy to get you that information after. I don't have that right in front of me. Um, so Groton Utilities would have to take that on, the shareholders. And then if they amortize that over years and years, the energy costs, because we all pay for all the infrastructure, whether we want to believe it or not, would make it such that it might not be competitive, probably would not be with Eversource rates. So I think we need to look at, I know the intent of the bill is to bring down uh, the cost of energy because everyone is upset about the cost of energy. Um, but I think that there are other things that they're doing in the energy committee that could help with that. And I just don't see this being a realistic option. So I just want to get that on the record. You know, even if this bill passes um, and let's say you 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 picked Noank, Noank decided they wanted to go forward. I don't think that Groton Utilities would, and the and the, it's owned by the residents, that it would make financial sense for them to be even able to do it. And it wouldn't be Groton Utilities' fault. It would just be the nature of the cost of the infrastructure. So that's what I was trying to get at. Um, thank you, Senator. And I, I would just caution on speaking, and I, I don't think you did speak on behalf of any of our um, local municipal utilities, but um, and I know I know you didn't, um, and they haven't submitted uh, any testimony on this matter uh, either way. But um, the bill is not intended to reduce energy costs, as much as that is an unintended outcome of what I believe to be, uh, you know, what, what would happen should um, privatize in certain areas. What is certain areas that are currently uh, supplied electricity by privatized um, utilities. Uh, by going to a model where it is owned by the public, that not just in terms of the the, the costs of providing the the um, the electricity and the reduced rates for ratepayers, but also the resilience of the system. I think there are just so many benefits to it. Um, but again, the intention is not a short term solution. It's really a long term uh, solution that it again, um, I, I would hope the can, committee would support. So. Uh, nonetheless, I, I hope to continue conversations about this bill, um, obviously, um, just based on the written testimony, uh, all, um, you know, five of the folks that supported it um, live within our district. So uh, it's an, a matter that's important to the people we serve. And um, I thank you for your time coming to the committee. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I would agree. I just don't want to give our constituents a, a false sense that if this bill passes, they will be able to create their own or merge with Groton Utilities and have it be, you know, at the same rates that they're getting right now, because that's not just, that's just not a realistic um, outcome for this. And I, you know, I apologize. I thought the intent of this bill would be to lower energy costs, because that's what I continue to hear from the district. Um, if it's not to lower energy costs, then I'm, you know, as I said, I'm not, I wouldn't be clear what it is other than choice. And there is choice of delivery of service currently. So thank you for your time. And again, I appreciate Senator, the again, Senator, just to follow up, um, it is not the sole reason. Uh, it is an un unintended benefit uh, to passing this legislation. And of course, um, we should do everything in our power to reduce utility rates. I would note, this is not the Energy and Technology Committee. Therefore, we're not deliberating on it. What we are deliberating on is allowing ratepayers in our communities that live in fire districts to hold referendums to make that choice. They want to join an existing public utility or start one on their own. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Summers. I guess we're going to start off a little spicy this morning.
Uh, up next, we have online, I believe, Dr. Anwar, Senator Dr. Anwar. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, um, Honorable uh, Chairs, uh, Rep uh, Rep Representative Kavros de Graw and Senator uh, M.D. Rahman and uh, Ranking Members uh, Senator Fazio and Representative Zulo. I'm going to be speaking on Senate Bill 43 in uh, support of Senate Bill 43. I have a pretty detailed testimony. I just wanted to mention that I'm uh, one of the co-chairs of the Crumbling Foundation Caucus. Uh, this caucus uh, includes Representative Jamie Foster uh, and uh, Senator Jeff uh, Gordon and Representative Tom Delnicki as well. Um, it's a bipartisan, bicameral uh, caucus where we have been looking at uh, the challenges with Crumbling Foundation in our state. Thousands of victims uh, have been impacted, and thankfully, the state has uh, done a phenomenal job to be able to address this. Uh, we have created an entity, CIFSIC, and you will later hear from the superintendent of uh, CIFSIC, Mr. Mike McLaris, who will be able to speak to you in much more detail. I'm just warming you guys up with the information that we are hoping to um, have a discussion on. Um, one of our uh, previous bills, uh, Public Act 21-120, had uh, uh, talked about uh, using the best practices and identifying ways how we can prevent crumbling foundation in the rest of the state. And, and this bill is uh, looking at the initial data that uh, the, the work that CIFSIC has done. They have tracked in, in so much depth and detail different components of uh, the risks uh, to crumbling foundation and they have identified when we look at the residential uh, construction as well as the industrial or commercial uh, construction there are some patterns that uh, have uh, helped us recognize that the uh, the the industrial and and, and commercial construction um, has patterns which have been protective for the industry and 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 this is giving us uh, an opportunity to create best practices to reduce the risk going forward and and those uh, specific uh, items have been highlighted in the testimony in detail um, we've given more detail than you may want to be interested in but i it, it's uh, starting the process and um, this uh, committee, the Planning and Development Committee, has been instrumental to help thousands of our citizens and protect uh, them uh, in the last many years. And, and the, the journey continues on, and we want to make sure that we have a prevention strategy that will reduce uh, the needs for uh, organizations and CIFSIC to be able to fix homes because we will prevent them from getting crumbling foundations. Again, thank you for allowing me to be able to speak and later today you will hear from the uh, superintendent of CIFSIC who will be able to tell you in more depth about the specific quality measures. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. Anwar, Senator Anwar. <laughs> uh, seeing no questions at this time, thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Good luck in public thank health. You. Thank you. Up next, uh, we have Mayor Florsheim. I am not seeing him online or in person. Mayor Florsheim, any chance you're there? Okay, moving on to Representative Foster. Good morning uh, to the chair. Congratulations on your chairmanship. This is the first time I've been before you today. It's lovely to see you up there. And to Chair M.D. Raman, Ranking Members Fazio and Zulo, and um, to my federal fellow delegation members, Rep. Hall. Um, I'm here today in support of two bills, Senate Bill 43. I'll defer to Senator Anwar's testimony as he recently preceded me, and I'm sure I don't need to be redundant to vocalize my support. But I'm here today to talk a little bit more in depth about House Bill 6293. Uh, as some people know, the town of East Windsor is home to the state's outsized share of commercial sol solar farms. And this has been a significant municipal struggle because solar farms do not contribute in the same way to local property taxes as other industry that may come in. And oftentimes, the communities feel comfortable with tax abatements going to real, true farmland, but feel significantly different when there's a significant fiscal investment in solar arrays that is not the same, and they're not sharing, um, shouldering their share of local property tax. So Rep, uh, Representative Hall introduced uh, House Bill 6293, which would defer local zoning control to our communities as these projects are cited. 
East Windsor likely would not have homed, housed any of the three solar arrays if it were up to our local planning and zoning commissions. And although um, meeting our local solar goals are admirable, there are significant detractions in having zero local control over the siting of these projects, including that setbacks can't be determined locally. So local planning and zoning commissions spend significant amounts of time considering how new properties, business, and industry will impact the local um, culture, climate, and aesthetic of a community. And in a strong agricultural community, not being able to make determinations on setbacks is a significant detraction from the local planning and zoning commission. And so although there might be room for compromise between the state siting council and state jurisdiction and local control, of which I'd be amenable to those conversations, there also needs to be significant consideration of what these community, what these investments of local solar arrays are doing to the community. And right now, it is not consistently the case that large grid scale solar projects are negotiating with the local municipalities on tax stabilization agreements and amount that they're investing in local property tax or the aesthetic that they're contributing to the community. And local communities are struggling. East Windsor has three large grid scale solar projects. Ellington, which I also represent, has two in the works. One of the projects online in Ellington is at a local airport. And this airport has prime and important farmland that's currently being leased to farmers that will no longer be available. There's no real deference to um, preserving prime and important farmland. And there's separate bills to invest in significant more state investment for preservation of farmland. But the rate that farmland is being converted to solar arrays is really quick. In Ellington, if this local slot of land that's currently cited for commercial development became a solar array, it would be a significant detraction of what it could otherwise be developed as if it was developed as a commercial property, either rental units like a commercial industrial warehouse complex or um, local buildings, the tax rate is significantly different. And so towns spend significant amounts of time drafting their local plans of conservation and development and deciding on local planning and zoning ordinances. And these are entirely overlooked once a local project is being cited. And so I'd like to draw attention to wetlands considerations being deferred on and local setbacks. Those are the priorities I think my local planning and zoning commissions would prioritize if they had the opportunity to, but I'm happy to take questions and speak about the five projects specifically that have been cited in my local community as I have a lot of experience with these projects and local controversy. Thank you. Thank you. I see we already have a question from Senator Fazio online. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, it's always nice to see the good representative and the, the good vice chair of the Energy and Technology Committee before us. Um, we appreciate your testimony and um, bringing, uh, shedding some light on this important topic that, um, you know, is similar to the testimony that Senator Summers gave. Um, it, I, you know, I think basically we have all the power under statute currently is is essentially shifted all it um it is given all towards the developer and towards the siting council you have basically a complete override of local planning and zoning input uh, and then on top of that you have the the basically the tax exemption i think it's up to three megawatts for these developments um uh as a rule and that covers most i think um, most solar arrays, there are very few that I think are bigger than that in the state. Um, so, you know, from my point of view, there, there certainly is a conversation to be had. There's a lot of different mechanisms that um, uh, that we could use as a legislature to try to bring a little bit more balance to the situation. Um, but representative are, I guess, I guess you're leaning a little bit more on the planning and zoning side than the tax side. Um, as a preference uh, for for the road that we go down here, I have I have thoughts on it, and you know I think there's a lot of room for compromise, and I'm 
I'm more than willing to have conversations about this as this process continues to move forward, because I think the conversations we had yesterday in energy and technology about tax stabilization um, or per megawatt charges um, for local tax is important. And I think that that's one way to rein in some of this development speed um, or make it more amenable to the municipalities. But something that planning and zoning offers that's not currently being considered at the siting council in a way that I think meaningfully is changing the trend of how these are being cited is that local planning and zoning members are elected and represent communities with local values. For example, my agricultural community might have a conversation with a local farmer who wants to lease or develop a fraction of their farmland as a solar array as part of their retirement strategy and they might that is an important process that i think we need to give farmers farmers are not able to retire and or pass on their farms intergenerationally the way they once were and so by taking away um the ability for a farmer to use this as their retirement strategy might happen um, if a overriding decision was made in one town or another to totally prohibit the development of solar process. That being said, um, if they're not developing solar, a farmer might sell their land for development of property, for housing, or for commercial development, and either of those options would be significantly larger tax contributors to the town. And so I think local conversations matter here, and I represent three towns that overwhelmingly favor local control as they make their decisions. And I try and make sure that that value is relayed in every testimony that I give, that they want to keep as much control locally as they possibly can. I am amenable to there being a share of responsibility between the siting council and planning and zoning. I think that there is room for that to happen. Um, between shared jurisdiction, and I'm not sure where their la that line should be. But right now, on some of these projects, the town doesn't even have the ability to negotiate the surrounding aesthetic of a farm, um, the type of trees planted to create a site barrier between the solar array and the families that have lived for 30 or 60 years across from farmland. Um, and those are significant local concerns that planning and zoning would listen to and hear in a way that's different than what I think is being heard at the siting council. Additionally, when something is being heard by the siting council now, to have public input, that is a meeting that needs to be requested by the local town. And oftentimes the way that local these notices are being shared with municipal CEOs, it's not clear to them immediately how they are supposed to intervene in this process. So for example, we had a uh, a project middle road solar array in Ellington that was recently cited before the siting council. And by the time planning and zoning met between when they noticed the town, people had come organized to come before the planning and zoning meeting hoping that that was their place to intervene and intercede and they had one day's notice that the next conversation was going to be happening at the siting council the next day and that's not people aren't used to making considerations about local construction new business new enterprise coming in through the siting council and so it was a surprise that was really disappointing to my community that the planning and zoning meeting that they were at wasn't the right place and they needed to, to quickly reorganize and reach out to the siting council for the very next day and that process made it challenging for me to intervene in advocacy for them in that short window of time and so i think that there has to be room for some compromise between local control and state control because as you know mm -hmm. as the ranking member on energy and technology we do need to meet our green energy goals and a lot of times not always but oftentimes these local solar companies um, are meaningful contributors um, the gravel pit solar project in east windsor has a really well negotiated tsa with the town um, that i think the municipality has is happy about because it addresses nuisance and it's not on prime and important farmland which i think makes a big difference in my local community it's on a gravel pit and so they're comfortable with that project yeah. in a way that's different than this one cited on farmland and, and did you submit written testimony uh, to representative um i am going to submit it after today i haven't finished it yet great thank you we appreciate that thank you for your testimony yep my pleasure thank you senator fazio representative hall 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and welcome. Uh, it's always good to see uh, my fellow representative that we share a town um, representing. So thank you for testifying on this particular bill. Um, I guess what I'd, I'd like to hear a little bit more about is um, the state process to these towns when it comes to their plan of conservation and development. So for example, does Ellington and East Windsor, when they put together their 10 year, you know, template for what they want to see in their town, address these solar, I'm going to call them projects, because I think solar farms yeah. is a, a big misnomer. Yeah. So we'll say solar projects. Um, do they do they look at these in their POCDs? That's a great question. So uh, highlight background is we requ the state requires these municipalities to put together this plan of conservation and development. And the municipalities are interpreting, this is my municipal CEO's word, not mine, but of both of my towns. They're, we are requiring them to put together these plans and then we are entirely disregarding that strategy um, when the siting council overrides um, siting of local solar. Um, so, one of the one of the examples, the Ellington Airport Solar Project, that is on our um, development corridor. So the Ellington Plan of Conservation and Development has made significant investment in looking to see our business enterprise along Route 83. And this is a significant plot of developable land that is currently zoned as commercial. And it is one of the few spots of land left on this road that could be zoned commercial that will allow the majority of the rest of the town to remain residential and agriculture and keep our commercial um, development along this route. That is a really strong, significant community value. And so if this is getting developed into something, they would rather see it be any other commercial, this is me um, speaking on behalf of a chair of planning and zoning, they have told me they would rather see this be developed as anything else commercially that would be a more significant tax contributor. And it would allow for further development of things the town needs and wants to see locally that would contribute more greatly, not just to the town economy, but to the town's values. And that's what's in our POCD, not for this to become a solar array project. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I think that's an important point. We we task these municipalities and cities with doing these POCDs, and then the state is, is granted the latitude to completely disregard them. Mm -hmm. um, we don't do that with any developments in our local cities and municipalities, businesses, commercial enterprises, residents all have to comply with our local regulations. So um, your points are well taken. And um, can you talk a little bit, I mean, you touched a little bit on the retirement piece in some of these farms and we certainly mm -hmm. don't wanna restrict, we, we obviously can't restrict folks on um, what they uh, sell their, their property or lease their property for. We're just simply saying, they have to comply with our local regulations. Right. Um, there's programs out there for farm preservation. Mm -hmm. um, and you touched on even the, sh we have a huge shortage uh, in housing in this state, which I think we all can agree on. Um, but there's, there's programs out there for our farmers to preserve their properties as farms and take a farm buyout. Can you touch a little bit on, I don't want to take us too far off, off mm -hmm. course, but you open the door with, with the retirement piece. So can you talk a little bit about that yeah. and how it ties into this bill? So I'm really grateful that you asked this question. So I have struggled. I'm glad you introduced this bill. One of the things I've struggled with significantly is as representing an agricultural community, the farmers don't want to see restrictions on what they can do with their own land. And so giving local control in a community that considers themselves as a right to farm town um, might not put significant restrictions on what a farmer can do as part of their retirement. However, as I mentioned, it's hard for farmers to retire. There's less intergenerational passing on of farms from one generation to the next. And so I think um, 
and I would defer to them to clarify this, but I think the Farm Bureau and a lot of agricultural advocates would tell you that they don't want anyone telling a farmer what they can do with their own land. And so what I have tried to do is champion carrot methodologies to incentivize farmers to opt into farmland preservation programs. So House Bill 6725 has raised the cap that the state can pay for farmland preservation. And I think that there's a bunch of these different strategies. Um, Senator Fazio raised the discussion that we had yesterday in energy and technology. Um, this bill is before 6725 is before the Environment Com Committee. And I think that between a variety of these different methods, if we give some local control back on local siting, we make sure that municipalities are getting stable tax on grid scale solar projects. And we make sure farmers have a more economically viable option to preserve their farmland if that's the case. We could see a significant slowing of single or small numbers of towns being focused on for the development of solar. I, my municipal CEO who submitted testimony uh, for Selectman Bowza on this bill, our municipal CEO, he, um, he had at one point said, what if you just capped it after you house over a hundred megawatts of grid scale solar, which East Windsor far exceeds. After you exceed a hundred, then you have local control and deference to solar arrays. And I, you might want to set it lower than a hundred, but I think that that's an option is to say, we need to meet our solar goals. We can't significantly slow down the process of development if we're going to get there, but farm main communities are being disproportionately targeted. It's optimal. It's cleared already. It's flat. Um, it gets enough sun. We know that because it grew crops. Um, and so it's, we need a sort of found balance. And so the farmers need options to retire. And if they want to be developing solar as something they're doing on their own land that they worked for generations, then I don't want to see us make it harder on those farming families. However, um, we need to expand the amount of options so that they have options that are consistent with their values. And I think that 6725 is hopefully part of that solution. And so my hope is that between what we heard yesterday and energy and technology, the municipalities will see more stable tax generation. Between conversations around this bill, we can give some local zoning control back. And where that line ends up, I think any progress on that would be a real victory for our towns, um, even if it's some compromise. And I think that um, incentivizing farmland preservation higher, that's like the perfect combination. Last year, we passed maximizing rooftop solar arrays, um, allowing uh, companies to do that. And I think that we're sort of doing these combination of things that'll relieve some pressure from farmland, which is one of my primary goals. Just a final comment. Um, I, I think it's interesting that our neighbor to the north, Massachusetts, um, actually incentivizes projects going along the highways yeah. and in more of a industrial or commercial zone, if you will. And I was talking to First Selectman Bowser the other day about this. He said, not only do they incentivize these projects, but they also disincentivize them if they move into residential areas or take away prime farmland. So um, it's interesting that our, our good neighbors to the north who are very uh, pro-solar um, actually have a, a disincentivizer, if you will, in place to scoff up farmland and put them in the middle of a residential neighborhood. So uh, I found that very interesting, but thank you for testifying. I appreciate it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm just gonna double check Zoom, uh, seeing no other questions at this Thanks. time. Thank you so much, Representative Foster. Uh, next up, we have Mayor Lauren Garrett and on deck is Bob Carlson. Good morning, Mayor. You're All right, on. good morning. Hi, how is everyone? Okay, I am um, I am here to give testimony on two bills this morning. Um, the first one is House Bill 6556, an act concerning the online pu publication of legal notices by municipalities. Um, just a little explanation first. Um, we just updated our charter last fall. 
And we had to spend about $20,000 to print word for word our charter um, in a local newspaper. And what we used was a, um, a newspaper that isn't really widely circulated, but it was in enough places for it to qualify. If we had to go with a larger um, newspaper, it would have been probably double the price. Um, so during a time where municipalities are really trying to be more transparent and provide as much information as possible uh, to the public, but also save money, uh, I think that a, a good solution for um, printing in newspapers, where not everybody gets the newspaper, is to provide a title in the newspaper and then um, publish on the website. We regularly provide paper copies of anything in our library, at the government center, um, and at a select few places around town. We also have made a lot of strides in providing more transparency um, for our residents to be able to access information by um, using this program called the Digital Navigators in Hamden at our libraries, where, um, where people who work for the library will go to residents and help them learn how to get online so that there isn't a, an information barrier in um, in terms of them being able to access information online. Um, it helps them with online banking, um, registering with the DMV. So there are a lot of benefits to the work that they're doing. But I think that in, in terms of how municipalities can start to save some money, um, this is an important bill um, so that we're still providing that transparency and that information to the public, but we're also, um, you know, finding ways to save some money by printing it mostly, um, having the information available online. For Hamden, we spend about $100,000 a year um, publishing into the newspaper um, notices from, um, like I said, our charter, which is only a 10-year event, um, but a, a lot of notices that have to go out through our town clerk's office, um, some RFPs, RFQs, and sale of town-owned property. Um, so I, uh, and a, a lot of notices through planning and zoning. So um, I would appreciate uh, your support for this bill. Um, the other bill, do you want me to um, pause for no, any go ahead. questions? Okay, go ahead. Then I'll go on to House Bill 5353. Um, and so this is uh, a bill that I asked my state delegation to um, support and um, to write. So um, this is for an act concerning certain municipal traffic authorities um, to uh, have the ability for the traffic authority to be independent of the police commission. So um, in doing, uh, in, in revising our charter, there was a, a big push um, over the last couple of years to separate out the traffic authority from the police commission because these um, these commissions do very separate things, uh, very different things. You have your police commission, which um, should be um, hiring, promoting, and in certain cases, disciplining police officers. But your traffic authority is really putting up street signs, stop signs, um, traffic signals, um, and hopefully creating um, really holistic policy um, for the way that um, traffic concerns are um, decided in town. Now, um, these, the, these different um, constituencies, these the different um, work that is done here tend to bring out very different people. Um, and I think that we can have that more holistic look at the way that traffic is handled if um, we have the option of having a traffic authority that is separate from the police commission. And um, I am in no way saying that this should be the way that every municipality goes. I know that there are other municipalities that might want to keep things status quo, but from my perspective, and I know that there are some other larger municipalities where the workload on the police commission um, is pretty great right now with a lot of retirements that are happening in other municipalities like we're seeing in Hamden. Um, there, there's Your three minutes is up, please summarize. Oh, 
Okay, I'm sorry. Um, that's about it. I would just like the ability to separate out the traffic from the police commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to go back um, to, to ask a question about the first bill you were testifying on. In sure. terms of the number of people who are going to the library to be trained and understand how to use the internet to be able to figure out more online services, do you have a sense of how many per year that you're seeing in the library receiving those services? This is a new program that our library put together, um, I would say two years ago, and I believe that they have had around 80 to 100 people come through the library um, for the Digital Navigator program. Um, it was started with a grant from, um, from the state library, and um, and so it's really amazing work. And they're also working with the state library to kind of regionalize this effort so that other municipalities can kind of see how our program is run and um, and have some of their residents go through our program. Thanks. I, I ask because I know that that's one of the common complaints that, you know, people say, well, I, I'm not up to speed online or I don't get my news online of a certain age, most people. Um, so I think that's really helpful that you're sort of proactively putting it out there, the skills so that if people, if we were to pass this, people would be able to find that information, if not on their own home computers, then certainly at the library computer. Uh, we do have a question from Rep D'Agostino. Adam Mayer, good to see you. Good morning. Thanks for, thanks for joining us uh, on both bills. Just to follow up on, on uh, the chair's questions with respect to the posting, so um, another issue that I think you can confirm that we've experienced in Hamden, and I'm sure it's happening in other, other towns and cities across Connecticut, is, of course, we, we, you've seen a shrinkage of, of newspapers that actually cover Hamden, right? So we don't even yes. have that many options anymore. That's um, correct. So we have the New Haven Register, um, which is fairly expensive for us to, um, to purchase ad space from. Um, and then we also have a, a smaller newspaper that is more online, but they also um, print out copies and distribute them in a couple um, locations around town. And it's technically distributed, uh, circulated and distributed far enough for it to be um, legally um, okay for us to use this online newspaper. The problem is that it is less accessible for us to use that um, that manner of publicizing our notices um, than the way that I'm suggesting we do this. Um, but we want people to be able to see our notices regardless. So we do publish them already on our website. Um, so we are providing the information already. I'm just requesting the ability for us to save some money and not um, have to um, advertise with uh, with the newspapers. So and, and, and obviously it would be exponentially more expensive to go with the register. And uh, I guess I'll, I'll add my own editorial comment, which is years ago, that money would have gone to local reporters and a local company, et cetera, et cetera, the register and these other statewide papers are now owned by uh, in many cases, private equity, hedge fund, and, and other companies and corporations, the money's just simply going out of state. Uh, and while we appreciate uh, the money we've been giving to the local reporter, it, it really is just a subsidy for for that paper, which is which is an online paper, and he kind of knows it when he charges us twenty grand for the charter. So um, mm -hmm. I, I think I think our experience in Hampton has been something that other towns are experiencing as well, and that's that's a lot of money that can be saved. Turning to the the commission uh, issue, and again, you, you mentioned this. The proposed bill obviously is just simply gives an option to towns. Um, I think the way we proposed it, Madam Chair, was fifty thousand or more. But I think I think I, Mayor Garrett, I'm sure you and I know I um, are are more than happy to have that be an option for any town that wanted it, uh, regardless of population. Uh, is that correct? Yes, I you know I think that it's important to have options and giving any municipality the option to separate out these commissions. Um, really would help us um, to develop more of a um, holistic approach to the way that we handle our traffic concerns. Um, we've just recently put together a policy on complete streets, and it allows us to have um, a, a better process in place for putting in traffic calming measures. And um, it, it wasn't easy for this to actually happen because our, our town engineer put together the policy. And when he went to go to 
um, the traffic authority, this is obviously the same as the police commission, and they had been in meetings um, every single week to hire and promote police officers. And by the time we got to the traffic authority meeting, they were exhausted. <laughs> You know, the, uh, the, the ability yeah. to um, retain that um, that enthusiasm uh, was diminished. And just finally, uh, one last question. This is this is something obviously that I think our, our police chiefs and our, our because they have to go to the police commission meetings, obviously, our, our police chief and our staff from yeah. the police department. And this is something that they support as well to to divorce this. They'd still have obviously a, a role and a voice with the traffic commission. but but separating the two is something that's got the support of our PD as well. So, yes, but also what I've done is it um, our, our traffic um, division in Hamden has been diminished because of budget cuts over the years. And so I have taken the, um, uh, the, the supervision of traffic from the police department and put it in the engineering department because um, traffic calming is really a function of engineering. And so the traffic authority doesn't really have the authority to put patrol officers um, for any kind of like speed traps. Really what they do is approve, you know, speed humps and stop signs. And so that's more of an engineering function. So now the traffic division reports to engineering, which has really helped to have this um, holistic approach to traffic and um, and the only reason we have a complete streets policy now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. That's a lot of food for thought there. Uh, Senator Fazio, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor, for your testimony. Um, can you explain what you um, maybe uh, in, in like terms, what you mean by a holistic uh, approach to traffic? I, I don't know that I'm familiar with that and it would be helpful. Sure. Them. So our complete streets policy, um, instead of um, people uh, making requests, emailing me or um, the traffic department and saying, you know, I need a speed bump on my street. We now have um, a, an approach, a policy wherein um, there there's a, a set of standards where you would put in a speed bump, but maybe a speed bump isn't appropriate for that street. Maybe there are other measures that um, can be implemented. And it it tends to um, be a really hot button issue because people very much believe that a speed bump is the absolute right thing, but maybe it's not. And we can use um, data-driven research to help us show people why it may not be the right thing. Um, and in terms of it just being holistic, it applies to the entire town rather than it being a street-by-street -street approach. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's that's an interesting uh, concept because I do think the rules-based uh, con uh, concept often makes sense because you'll get these one-off requests and um, and you should have basic standards. So I appreciate that. Um, I guess the, the other question is, I mean, when you're dealing with with traffic issues and traffic authorities, public safety is a concern. And so having it subsidiary to a police commission makes sense, uh, given that that is their um, that is their expertise. And and I understand that <clears throat> there's technical concerns and and you're delegating a lot to engineers and, and experts in traffic uh, specifically. And infrastructure issues as well, but you know, you know, keeping it subsidiary to a police commission, given the public safety, human life concern, would you know still make sense to me intuitively? Um, is that a concern for you, or, or how how are you? Um, uh, how do you confront that concern? Our town engineer works closely with our police chief to um, provide that complete streets and holistic approach to traffic safety. Um, a lot of times when people are asking for, um, you know, a patrol officer to, um, you know, take a look at somebody who's always running a stop sign, you know, if there's, there's an area where it's more of an enforcement issue, generally speaking, these um, emails come to me and then I, I send them off to the right person. Um, but 
when when it comes to the traffic authority, they're never going to vote to say place a patrol officer at a intersection because somebody has um, raised the concern that people keep running the stop sign. Um, the placement of patrol officers is always going to be up to the chief of police. That is not a function of the police commission or the traffic authority. Okay, I appreciate your testimony. I definitely wanna learn more about it. Um, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, seeing no other questions at this time, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you, good afternoon. Up next, we have Bob Carlson. I think you might be a first selectman, but your title got cut off, so I'm guessing. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for having me here today to speak. It's my first trip to the Capitol. Therefore, my first testimony, I'll do the best I can. I, um, I do, I've been told I have a strong Rhode Island accent. So if you don't understand something I said, I'll be glad to try to repeat it for you. Okay. Uh, I am from North Stonington, a uh, small town in population, 5,200 people, uh, 57 square miles. That comes out to about 97 people per square mile. We've known for our farms and our stone walls and probably more animals than people. In the last three or four years, we've accepted three solar farms, uh, solar projects that were sent to us by the siting council. Um, and I want to uh, talk about some of the Senate, uh, Rep. Forster said there's very little control we have. I mean, we've had instances where this, the new project comes right up to somebody's house that's been there for you know, 40, 50 years, and their solution is put up a six-foot stockade fence to block the view of the panels after they've been looking at trees for 50 years or a field for 50 years. So, But I'm here to support um, Bill, uh, Senate Bill 506. And the reason I'm here for that is with these three solar farms, one I'm going to speak about today is a five megawatt solar farm. Also, two other farms that have come in recently. Uh, one is a 15 megawatt solar farm that's coming online on the 15th, I assume the um, July 1st of this year. And the second one, which is a 8.5 megawatt that's coming online at the end of this year. Uh, the 5.0, which uh, Senator Summers hit on before, um, that was finished in 2021. Our assessor went out and assessed that property, and the assessment was at six million four hundred thirty-three dollars and six million four hundred thirty-three thousand five hundred twenty-five dollars. The taxes on that is two hundred thirty-nine dollars, two hundred thirty-nine thousand eight hundred eighty-six dollars. The bill went out in 2021; has yet to be paid. When we went to them and said, "What's the matter? Why aren't you paying this bill?" They said, "Well." because we're not a five megawatt solar farm, we're a two, two and one, which is ridiculous. They were cited by the council as a five megawatt farm and now they've changed that game. A small town like ours, we don't have the kind of money that we can throw at attorneys to take these people to court. If this continues to happen, it just, it, it kills the small conservative budget that we work through. And, um, and if every time this happens, we have to go to court, it's gonna cost the town a lot of additional funds. My concern is that the other two farms see this and see that if they can get away with doing this, what happens to the 5, 8.5 and what happens to the 15? Do they now change to a 33333 or however they want to divide it up? Um, it's it's a big concern to a small town like ours. We, we Even though we don't have much control, when the Southern Council sends a project to our town, we at least like to get taxation on this. It makes the makes it a little bit less less of a hurt to our small town. Um, while I'm here, I also want to say that Mayor Garrett just spoke on uh, the placement of of legal ads. And again, with a small budget, anything we can do to save money on that, I'm, I'm supportive for a testimony on, I think that was House Bill 6556. But back on 506, um, does anything- Your three do minutes is up, please summarize. Thank you. Anything that this committee can do to help us uh, with this to uh, a small town, uh, we'd appreciate it. I'll accept questions if needed. Thank you so much for your testimony. I see questions from Senator Fazio. Thank you, Mr. First Selectman. Where do you kind of see this going? Given that you don't have the control over the over the zoning and the siting, and given that you um, had this arbitrage um, where developers can avoid property taxes. Are, are you are you worried that as we um, have greater proliferation of solar, which I think is a good thing, generally speaking, um, 
you know, do, do you worry that this just, that there's, there's not like a logical limit here to your ability either to um, collect revenue or to kind of maintain quality of life and other uh, zoning planning concerns in your town uh, without some sort of legislative fix? So I'm not here to, um, to fight against additional solar farms in my town, although I would like to have more local control. Um, when people come to my office, uh, taxpayers come in and they see a solar farm that's just maybe destroyed the scenic area of one part of my town, and then I have to tell them, but we might not collect taxes on it either. That's a concern. Where do I see it going? I, it, it depends on what happens with this first 5.5 if or 5.0 solar farm. If this is allowed to not pay us taxes, and we lose those taxes again on the second two, and who knows what the siting council might send our way in the years to come. Uh, this is, is just going to be a, a large tax loss to our town. The numbers, like I said, 239,886. 239, uh, that's a big number in my budget. And um, it's something that we, uh, we're going to have uh, trouble dealing with in the future. Well, thank you for your testimony. We always appreciate the, the on the ground testimonial um, to inform our decision making. And, and I think it's certainly an issue where uh, we have to find a good compromise. So appreciate it. Thank you. Seeing no other questions at this time. Thank you so much, sir. Thank have you. a great afternoon. Thank you. Up next, we have uh, Walter. I'm hoping I say this right, Mamlock. Walter, are you with us? Okay, great. I want to thank the legislatures for allowing me to speak today in support of the House Bill 6805. My name is Walter Mamlock. I'm a father, a grandfather, and a retired music educator who taught in the Connecticut Public Schools for over 33 years. I live on a fixed income, state teachers' retirement, and Social Security. Here are some facts. Baby boomers make up over 21% of Connecticut's population and 16% of the Connecticut population is made up of people 65 or older, and Connecticut is one of the least affordable states to retire in. I've owned four homes and, like most of my friends, decided to downsize when we became empty nesters. The idea of maintenance-free living is very appealing to an older population. Because of that, I chose to live in Goodwin Village in East Hartford, I purchased my standalone unit, 3 Joanne Drive, in 2013. Living on a fixed income in Connecticut is challenging. Budgeting for utilities isn't easy. I try to live as environmentally sensitive as possible. I've had my home tested and rated for its efficiency. I've changed all the light bulbs, and I drive a plug-in hybrid car. Yet, while my kilowatt uses has gone down, my electric bill keeps going up. I've known about solar energy and its possibilities since doing a science project as an eighth grader in 1962. And lo and behold, I've lived long enough to see its reality, but I can't take advantage of it. Why? Well, apparently it's you, the state Connecticut statutes. It does not allow people who live in condos to have solar panels. Connecticut needs to create solar access rights like those in Massachusetts, Arizona, Florida, California, and New York. This bill will affect a large population, a large portion of your population. I'm talking about people who are retired or about to retire, who live on a fixed income, who are choosing to own a home in a maintenance-free senior complex, who want to do their best, their part in reducing their carbon footprint and become independent of fossil fuels. This bill gives us a way to do that. By allowing us to install solar panels to create solar energy, we would be able to budget our utility costs, reduce our carbon footprint, live on our fixed income, and enjoy our golden years here in Connecticut. A lot of my friends have moved away because it's cheaper to live and retire in Arizona or Florida or the Carolinas, even Maine. This contributes to a low population growth, and Connecticut is the fourth lowest in the nation. That translates into a lower tax base. We need to attract people to want to move into and stay in Connecticut. This bill is a step in the right direction. Adding solar panels is a home improvement project for the future. My Eversource bill is now over $300 a month. 
and solar panels would reduce it to $10 a month. That is a substantial savings for anyone, particularly someone on a fixed income. Your when three you minutes is up. If you could please summarize. Sure. It's a win-win for everyone. And I need your help. It's your turn to do your part and adopt House Bill 6805. It will give your constituents the freedom of choice and will make Connecticut a better place for all of us to live. I want to thank you for listening. And I've given rep my representative, the Honorable Jeff Curry, a digital copy of my testimony, which includes the websites that state all the facts I've used. Thank you so much for your testimony. I think that some of us on this committee thought that this was taken care of last year in Senate Bill 4. One of my questions to you, because it's a condo, do you know if you share a roof, do you share a roof with someone else? No, I independent? have a standalone. A standalone roof. Okay. Standalone unit. Okay, so those are the units that I think that we're trying to address in this bill uh, as effectively I, as we can. <laughs> and I appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, just any other questions while we're here? Okay, well, thank you for your service as a teacher and thank you so much for testifying today. Well, thank Anything you we can do to keep people here, I'm all for it. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Up next, we have John Guskowski, please. Uh, thank you very much, um, Madam Speaker, or uh, Madam Chair. Um, members of the committee. Um, I apologize, I'm on the road. I've pulled over to a safe place. Um, but uh, my name is John Guskowski. I'm a certified planner and certified zoning enforcement officer. I'm here uh, testifying as government relations officer for the Connecticut chapter of the American Planning Association. Um, I'm here to testify in favor of House Bill uh, 6556, which is an act concerning online publication of legal notices by municipalities. Um, we believe this bill is long overdue uh, and it reflects both uh, the efficiency of available technologies today, uh, as well as uh, cost savings for municipalities and a strong reflection of how we um, as, as citizens get our information. Um, the longstanding law uh, that requires towns to post notices in newspapers having substantial circulation um, in that community for all legal notices uh, makes no sense in an age when um, it made sense in an age when newspapers were, in fact, the primary source of information to the public, but it does not make any sense uh, anymore. The, there are two problems with it. Number one, uh, virtually nobody gets their information about legal notices from the newspaper anymore. And two, it's forcing towns, as the mayor of, of Hamden noted, uh, to pay tens of thousands of dollars, um, often with no check on what the costs are for, uh, virtually monopolistic pricing. Um, we as planners and zoning officers have been doing informal surveys amongst our communities um, about where people get information about public hearings um, since 2017, 2018, uh, pre-COVID. And even then, um, fewer than 5% of respondents and attendees of public hearings uh, were read about it, were informed about it by newspapers. Um, most were uh, directly notified because they were a butters and got a, a piece of mail, uh, but the rest were via websites and social media. Um, and since COVID, this trend has accelerated and the use of electronic notifications have proven extremely effective and public engagement has in fact increased. Um, so we recognize that legal notices are a major revenue stream for newspapers and newspapers are important, um, but that's a market problem, uh, not a problem of, about freedom of information or the right of the public to be informed. Um, so if newspapers were still indeed the primary information system um, or if they were more cost effective and efficient, uh, than website publications, then it would continue to make sense. But, um, and this bill does not eliminate uh, a newspaper option. It simply adds another option uh, to reflect existing well-functioning notification technology. Um, so in closing, we would recommend a couple of considerations to ensure that legal notices are properly timestamped on websites um, and are placed in easy to find uh, intuitive locations on municipal websites. Um, but it's this this bill is long overdue and, and this update, um, it, it's time has come. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Thanks so much for your testimony. Thank you. Have a great day. Up next, we have Aiden Gonzalez and Mike DeLuca on deck. Hi, everybody. Um, dear chairs and members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Aiden Gonzalez, and I live in New Haven as a student of Yale University. I'm testi testifying in strong support of House Bill 5868 
an act authorizing municipalities to impose a tax on the endowment funds of private institutions of higher education. I speak as a student of Yale, one of many, many students who is appalled and embarrassed by the historic and current disinvestment that Yale has made and continues to make in its host city of New Haven. Every year, Yale receives a, receives a tax break of almost $200 million for, for its tax exempt status as a nonprofit. Yale, as an institution with an endowment of $46 billion, gets to choose how and where they want to make their piecemeal donations to the city that hosts and sustains it, which total a fraction of a fraction of what they owe and what they should be paying to the city of New Haven. Meanwhile, 40% of New Haveners are unable to afford the basic needs of housing and food. The New Haven public schools are operating on a severe staffing shortage, which I know you all have heard a lot about, and property rates and taxes are increasing, further burdening low-income families who are already unfairly pulling Yale's weight as they fund the public goods that all people living in New Haven pay for, including Yale students and faculty and other affiliated um, Yale people. If a city like New Haven could tax Yale's 20... $42.3 billion endowment, the city could invest um, millions and millions and millions of dollars in equity by reducing class sizes, fixing the teacher and educator shortage in our public schools, ensuring that every public school student has access to a full-time nurse, school librarian, school social worker, and college counselor, fully staff special education and English language learning classes, offer free SL, ESL classes and GED classes to adults, and so much more. As the wealthiest state in the country, Connecticut should be a shining example for the nation where every family has what they need to live a good life. But instead, Connecticut is a state where hundreds of thousands of working people are struggling to raise families, even while private universities such as Yale are adding billions to their endowments and failing to pay um, to the city. We have an unprecedented opportunity and the resources to create a state where everyone has good health care to lead healthy lives, high quality child care and schools for their kids, and a good job to support their families, a safe place to call home. I urge the committee to have the courage to make the right choice and pass House Bill 5868, an act authorizing municipalities to impose a tax on the endowment funds of private institutions of higher education. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We especially love having students come in and that was a well thought out and executed testimony. What percentage do you think perhaps that the university should pay? Because if we are saying that the municipalities can impose a tax, what do you think would be appropriate? Um, so I study history and education and I don't know all of the details of finance. Um, I am sure that people do and will be able to figure this out. I just know that it is. Um, unfair and uh cannot go on that Yale Yale's endowment is not taxed. So I don't I don't have any specific details, but I'm sure there are people that do. Sorry. That's okay. I just figured we'd ask just in case. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm not seeing any other questions at this time. We appreciate you being here. Up next we have Mike DeLuca followed by Jennifer Widness. Welcome Mr. DeLuca. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Mike DeLuca. I am the group publisher of the Hearst Connecticut Media Group, as well as the president of the Connecticut Daily Newspaper Association. Um, I'm here in, in opposition to Bill 6556. Um, just for your information, the, the, the Hearst Daily Papers that I oversee are the Connecticut Post, the New Haven Register, the Danbury News Times, the Norwalk Hour, the Stanford Advocate, the Greenwich Time, the Torrington Register Citizen, in the Middletown Press. So requiring public notices to be posted in newspapers helps ensure that the public has access to important information about government activities and decisions and that government agencies are transparent and accountable. It is imperative these notices are published by a credible and, and almost as importantly independent body. One of the main reasons why public notices should remain in the newspapers and newspaper websites is accessibility. Newspapers are still widely used as a source of information for many people, particularly those who are not tech savvy who, or, and who do not have access to the internet. Placing public notices in newspapers ensures that a broad cross section of the public will have access to this critical information. Furthermore, placing public notices in newspapers allows for individuals to access information at their own pace, unlike the internet where information is subject to algorithmic filtering. Newspapers are also an important record of public notices. 
By placing public notices in newspapers, there's a permanent record of the notice, which can be accessed by the public in the future. This is particularly important for legal notices in public meetings, as individuals may need to refer to those notices at a later time to understand the context of a particular decision or action. While we all know the digital world is susceptible to hacking and ripe with this information, there can be no man manipulation to a permanently archived print record. Finally, placing public notices in newspapers and newspaper websites also helps ensure that notices are seen by a cross section of the public. Social media algorithms, search engine optimization, and other online tools can make it very difficult for people to find the information they need. By placing public notices in newspapers, individuals do not need to rely on algorithms to find the information that they need. In conclusion, public notices are an important tool for transparency and accountability in government and business. Placing public notices in newspapers and newspaper websites ensures the public has access to this critical information and provides a permanent record of the notice and helps ensure that these notices are seen by the public. Therefore, public notices should remain in newspapers and newspapers websites. I will, will also say that, um, you know, we are wide open to, to working with the towns and municipalities where there is an issue here. We want to be, in, in, in the case of public notices, we want to be an ally to the communities that we serve, and we're, we're open to discussion about it. Thank you. Thank you. I am seeing no questions at this time online or in person. Thanks. Oh, wait, Representative Delnicki. Thank you, Madam Chair. A uh, really quick question. You made reference to the fact that some folks don't have the internet and the public notice uh, in the paper would be basically the way they would be able to obtain that information. Uh, do you have any idea what percentage of the public would not have the ability to find it online based on not having the internet or some other ability like that? Uh, I, I don't know I don't know how many don't have the internet. I do know that a, a very, very a, a, a lot of our uh, readers are not internet savvy and so they may have broadband in their their home. I'm not so sure that they access that on a regular basis. And And one follow-up question. So based on having the internet, you'd actually have to go and seek out the legal notice from a particular town, as opposed to if you were thumbing through the paper, you'd go right to the page where the public notice is. Uh, I'm sorry, I would, what, what did you um, I'm just asking the question pertaining to the fact that if an individual wanted to check on public notices, for a particular town, they'd actually have to go to the town's website, as opposed to looking in the paper and thumbing to the section that had the public notices and they could scan them for the entire area. Yeah, well, what what I would say, I'm not sure what, what all of the towns are specifically doing, but what I would say in the case of the newspaper and particularly online, which is what you're referring to. So we are we are part of a group, the Connecticut Public Notices.org, where all of the Connecticut newspapers are required to, to upload any public notice into that website. And so if you were to go on one of our sites, for example, you would simply go to the classified section and then you would go to uh, the notices section and there you would have access to every public notice uh, online. Well, thank you for your testimony and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to ask a couple of questions. Thank you. Senator Fazio. Thank you for your testimony, sir. You know, obviously this, uh, this statute um, made sense at when uh, when we didn't have you know easily accessible internet um, and and nothing is going to be universally accessible but um, there is pretty broad access um, and so I, I'm I just I just struggle with understanding why why we need to impose the fiscal burden on municipalities which are already strained when there are other alternatives for making thing, making these notices widely accessible um you, you know 
it's just it's just tough and 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 you have a lot of these smaller municipalities that like you heard before are having to um expend tens of thousands or more taxpayer dollars um that they could use on other services when uh, it would be easier to post the notices online um, that are easily accessible on the town's website and elsewhere um, without the same cost. So I'm just kind of wondering if you can comment on on why you don't think this is kind of an anachronistic policy. Sure, I, I, I get it. And I and I think that we, we want public notices to be available in more places, not less places. And so I think the the the, the argument that I, I would make, sir, is is it's about the the security of the public notice. So I think we all know that online can be manipulated very easily. I mean, you look at chat GPT today, you look at Facebook, you look at Google and some of the news and the information that's coming out and it can be questionable at times. And there, although paper is considered an older medium, it, it you can't manipulate a print record. And so I think it's just important that it remains in the public newspaper and online like we're doing. And as I said before, I'm, I'm wide open to any other suggestions to keep the spirit of this going, but to also be able to keep, you know, hold account um, the decisions and the things that are happening in the communities for the sake of the, the people who live there. And uh, and as I said, I, I, I wanna work with you guys. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, the I, I, get, I get the memorializing um, I think you can memorialize things online too, especially if they're in more places. Um, and then it goes to the fact that the paper, it, it's not, it, you know, it, it, it costs something. It's not broadly accessible. Um, so I'm not quite sure that I agree with your assessment, although I appreciate um, your time and testimony and, and your, your, your plea to, you know, try to find some sort of common ground. Um, so I do appreciate your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is it okay if I make one more comment? Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, the the other thing that I just want to mention, I, I mean, I know I'm representing Hearst, which is not a hedge fund, by the way, but is a is a larger corporation. Um, in my responsibility of being the president of the Connecticut Daily Newspaper Association, I do represent many, many of the smaller newspapers across the state. And I will tell you that although this is, you know, I, I don't want this to be looked at as a greed thing, I will say that many of those newspapers rely on a portion of this revenue and enable, to enable them to be able to continue to cover these towns, these smaller and local local towns effectively. And the last thing that I think we need is news deserts. And if there isn't some uh, support um, for these smaller newspapers, they're gonna start, you know, dropping. And then we're not going to have anything in these communities. And, you know, I don't think any of us want that um, either. So. I would tend to agree with you. And before before you go, I, I would just say, I think Hearst is a $2.5 billion company right at this point. I Obviously not the portion that you manage, but overall the conglomeration is $2.5 billion approximately, right? Um, so I think that it's really difficult for us, and especially 169 small towns. On the one hand, I absolutely agree with you. Former journalist. You know, it's important that we have these newspapers because I, I know how much I value them. Um, I was lucky enough, I grew up with the Washington Post as my paper. And when I visit my family, I'm shocked to find that the Washington Post Democracy Dies in Darkness, owned by Jeff Bezos now, is about this thick. Mm -hmm. As a kid, it was probably this thick every day. Um, so I certainly empathize with the, we don't want people to lose their jobs. We, we don't want to lose newspapers. That They're critically important. I would say, though, I think that it is you know, as we've heard today, there has to be some sort of compromise because the towns can only do so much. And when you hear from a town that they've spent $100,000 in a year, that's exorbitant, <laughs> you know, just on this. And in terms of keeping the information safe, it could be that we have a paper backup like we do with our ballots. We have a paper backup somewhere in the town office so that if there was any kind of, you know, question to what might happen that you would actually be able to go someplace, see it filed away. Um, so I, I think that as long as when you say you're willing to work with the towns, that involves, you know, perhaps foregoing some of the the dollars attached to it, then maybe that's what they're looking for. Um, but I appreciate, you know, all of the the issues that go around this this one, you know, in, in, uh, bill that we're we're looking at. So I thank you for being here today. Thank you. Up next, we have Jennifer Witness and David Barkin on deck.
Good afternoon. Um, I'm Jen Witness, and I'm the president of the Connecticut Conference of Independent Colleges. And I'm here today to provide testimony on two bills before you, HB 6804, an act authorizing the assessment of fire district user fees on colleges and universities, and HB 5868, an act authorizing municipalities to impose a tax on the endowment funds of private institutions of higher ed. By way of background, CCIC is the association that represents the 15 private nonprofit colleges in Connecticut. Collectively, we enroll over 80,000 students in the state and award nearly half of the bachelor's degrees earned here each year and over 60% of the graduate degrees. Of the degrees awarded in key areas that are targets for economic growth in the state, engineering, computer science, bioscience, health professions, the majority are earned at the state's independent colleges. Over 70% of the students that attend our institutions who are Connecticut residents stay in state after graduation. Nonprofit colleges and universities are tax exempt in every state in the country. And this status is awarded to them because they provide a public good. The status provides necessary and important support allowing colleges and universities to pursue their mission of teaching research and service without operational funds from the state, unlike our public counterparts. At a time when higher education institutions are being called on each day to do more to address the workforce challenges this state is seeing in teaching, nursing, social work, and engineering, it's contradictory to simultaneously be proposing to tax these institutions that receive virtually no state support outside of a small amount from the Roberta Willis Scholarship Program. Our member institutions make significant contributions, financial and in kind, to the surrounding municipalities and residents and have a combined annual economic impact to the state of $16.5 billion. These institutions serve as magnets attracting students and their families, alumni and tourists that all spend locally yet use minimal municipal services. They are large employers in their communities and collectively employ nearly 30,000 people statewide. Nonprofit higher ed institutions are a net asset in their local communities. They're also strong community partners. They provide access to their athletic fields, museums, performances, their students and faculty volunteer in the communities. They have programs such as New Haven Promise, which makes college free for New Haven students to attend a public college in state. And they also work with local employers to build programs that suit their talent needs. We acknowledge the fiscal constraints that some of our municipalities face. However, many colleges and universities are managing financial stress of their own. The majority of independent colleges in the state rely heavily on tuition and fees for revenue and have endowments smaller than UConn. Requiring nonprofit colleges and universities to pay additional taxes or fees to our host communities would divert scarce resources from education, financial aid, and research and result in tuition increases. I also would say that the state funds generously the pilot program, which is the only one in the entire country where municipalities are reimbursed in part for the tax exempt colleges and hospitals that are located in their community. Uh, we would ask the committee members to not move forward with these bills. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Representative Baumgartner. Yes, uh, thank you so much for uh, testifying before this committee today. Um, great to see you in person today, yes, as opposed to uh, virtually yesterday. Um, I attended the Mitchell College uh, legislative, uh, legislative breakfast yesterday in uh, New London. Um, very much uh, want to thank uh, Dr. SB um, and uh, the rest of the team over at the college for uh, welcoming us and learning about the great things uh, that have happened over the last few years at, at the um, university and will continue to um, and for the years to come. But um, I do have a question uh, regarding kind of the scope of um, both of these bills. I know uh, for one of them uh, that you testified in opposition to, it's confined to just fire districts. Yeah. Um, so just curious as far as what the application of that would be um, of, of the, um, I would presume it would only impact communities that do have fire districts. So uh, case in point, a New London, a, a community I used to represent for the 41st district, uh, no longer, um, but they don't have any fire districts. So obviously that wouldn't cover it. So if you can just speak to that briefly. Sure. Um, I think that right now, uh, West Haven and the University of New Haven is one of the um, the towns that would be impacted. And also, I know Middletown has a number of fire districts, but I'm not, I haven't done the mapping to see where Wesleyan would fall in or out. But 
um, you know, the, really the purpose of pilot is to, to really cover that type of fee and that those challenges that, um, those communities are facing. So for example, the Allentown fire district gets pilot funding, not just the town of West Haven, but the Allentown fire district gets funding as well, um, for the tax exempt property that are in their, um, in that community. And, um, Remember, recall back in 2015, um, a speaker, 2015, 2016, then Speaker Sharkey um, was very passionate about these issues, you know, just having uh, represented uh, Quinnipiac. And um, at the time, I, I think Quinnipiac was um, growing at an exponential rate and kind of coming to terms with, oh, they need the service. We provide town services, yet we're not um, uh, receiving any kind of revenue associated with that outside of the existing uh, pilot programs, as you explained. Um, in New London, they do, uh, they're, I believe it's Mitchell College, um, and possibly Con College has engaged in, um, uh, a voluntary pilot program made directly by the universities. Can you uh, speak to that sure. uh, program? Um, in 2015, um, I was on maternity leave and a bill passed to, uh, tax, um, houses in, uh, communities that are housing more like a certain number of students. And so um, that was before President Espy's time too. And so Mitchell and Quinnipiac, um, there is some, you know, both of them, I think, have taken that law that's that's on the books currently um, and, and really used it as a conversation starter, right, with their local communities about like, what is a reasonable amount to pay? Because like you said, at the time, Quinnipiac had been purchasing housing in the neighborhoods and taking it off the tax roll. So Speaker Sharkey was really focused on that issue. And so those are the two institutions that are currently impacted by that. And I believe, like you said, Mitchell had sort of had conversations with the city of New London about what is a reasonable amount for the houses that Mitchell owns that, um, you know, that students live in. Um, and then that Mitchell and New and Con College also pay stormwater fees um, to the city of New London, which also was expanded by the legislature last year so that any town could do that now as well. And I think that's really our concern is that when you, like you noted that it, this is a narrowly defined bill for one probably community at this time, but everybody knows in the legislature that it's, it's obviously a slippery slope. And, you know, since you, I, you know, I can't remember when, I think you were just recently come back to the legislature in the last couple of years, the legislature has made a really strong commitment to pilot. And again, this is one of the only programs in the whole country that acknowledges the statewide benefit of the nonprofits, right? So we know that we have a significant economic impact. We know that we award a significant number of the degrees, but obviously in the host communities, that's not always the direct benefit. And so pilot is intended to sort of offset that just given the overreliance on property taxes, right, as the only form of local revenue in the state. So I think really the challenge is, is the diversification of taxes, which I think CCM acknowledges as well, but not necessarily our tax exempt status. So we would be concerned about even a very narrowly tailored bill moving forward because it could just be amended and expanded along the way. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and I would also note that um, one thing I believe this committee at some point um, passed, which ultimately subsequently became law, uh, was the uh, allowing of stormwater authorities, which has right. been a tool even in New London that has been deployed to actually, um, uh, you know, I guess receive revenue from the colleges, but uh, so that they can contribute to obviously maintaining their uh, stormwater infrastructure. So there are tools, as you mentioned, uh, already in place um, to, that would, you know, address you know, at least getting some kind of revenue from uh, our uh, nonprofit. Right. Uh, non oh, you know, sorry. I'm sorry, uh, uh, private universities. Right. Go ahead. I apologize. And that just passed in the last two years, the expansion of stormwater, you know, New London was the model. Um, we've obviously had concerns about it, but now there's language in place to say that, you know, if a college or university is investing locally and preventing runoff, that they mm -hmm. could get credit for it. So I, I agree with you. There's already some tools on the tools in their toolbox to diversify revenue when it comes to the nonprofits. Thank you. Well, I want to be um, considerate of other um, com committee members' time as well, um, and would also note that just again, and I, I do respect the intent of the bill, for just from the proponent of the bill, um, and that not all endowments are also created equally. I mean, Mitchell College, you know, does not, it's a smaller university, does not have the capacity to 
if should it, they ever have to pay property taxes, um, but they don't have the capacity to pay like a you know Yale or Wesleyan could. Um, so I do think that should be uh, recognized um, nonetheless. But uh, that's my job, not yours. So um, it was great, great to speak with you, and good to see you in person. Thank you. And just one last question: um, How many of the private universities willingly contribute, pay into the towns that they're in? I don't have an exact number, but I can. What we do have representative is a. Uh, um, like a, a, a pamphlet of like all the community contributions, right? So what I most schools try to do is to find ways to be supportive of their community that align with their mission, right? You know what I'm saying? To like leverage the assets that they have um, on campus to be a good community partner without necessarily like writing a check that doesn't have any sort of... Um, strings attached, you know, or, and so I think there's all the schools do so much and give so much, um, back to their communities and really are proactive about it because they understand that, you know, have being a good neighbor is important. Right. And so I know Yale's obviously I, I was frustrated by the la the student that testified because I just want to say Yale Yale's voluntary payment to the city of new Haven is $23 million a year. That's a contribution that they make. And it's the largest voluntary payment in the whole country. So it's it's frustrating at times when folks don't understand how much they give and how much they do. And I understand that's our job to sort of tell our story, but I can get you a list of the payments, but I can also get you a list of sort of the contributions because I think in Connecticut in particular, we've really been trying to be really strong community partners and our presidents take this really seriously. I think regarding Yale, they would probably say that, you know, it's it may, it may be one of the largest payments, but they also have probably the largest endowment if, or, yeah, well, or at least top five. To your <laughs> so, point, yeah, to your yeah. point, they're in a different place to yeah. Representative Baumgartner's point. They're like, you can't, mm -hmm. it's in a different place, right? And then if you look at everybody else, they're doing a lot. Um, and as much as they feel like they can afford to do, you know. And I would say the proponent of the bill, my understanding was there was concern over the dollar for dollar reimbursement, so to speak, of all the emergency calls that they have to engage in for that university or college. And so I think you know, if if they are seeing, it, it may be that in some communities, they're not seeing the benefit of the dollars from people that live and work at that university, you know, dollar for dollar back in terms of what they actually services they're providing to the university. I think that is the, the crux of, of that. And that's why these public hearings are honestly helpful because it gives you guys a chance to hear and re be reminded of what the schools are doing. So the University of New Haven is in West Haven and I understand that might be the concern um, and they'll get written testimony to outline sort of all that they do. And I'm pretty sure they actually do provide some, um, some funding to the city as well. Um, but they also have a sworn police force, which is unique. Um, not every college does have like their own sworn police force. So they are taking on a lot of this responsibility themselves, but happy to get you more information. I think the concern was more around fire and EMS, but yep. I hear what you're saying. Yep. Thank you so much for your testimony. Have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, David Barkin, please, followed by Andrea Dunn. Good morning, David. Good afternoon, I should say. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Committee on Planning and Development. Uh, my name is David Barkin. I'm Chief Architect at uh, DAS, uh, Real Estate and Construction Services. Um, and today I'm, I'm providing testimony on the uh, uh, House Bill 6802 on, on behalf of the Department of Administrative Services. We have submitted written testimony, so I'm not going to read that back into the record, but I'll just sort of try to summarize um for the committee uh uh our our support uh, basically there's three parts to the to the statutory changes that we that we are looking for uh, one has been talked uh, sort of extensively in other other avenues here about uh, hard copy advertising so i won't spend any time on that beyond uh, uh having similar uh, uh perspective on that um the the second item is is in support of increasing the threshold for both the military department and for the Connecticut uh, State Colleges and Universities system from two million to three million dollars. Uh, both of those um, uh, executive branch agencies, if you will, uh, uh, have significant uh, technical. Uh, 
capacity within within you know within their employee of architects and engineers and project managers, and the the changes make really reflect uh, inflationary pressures that have occurred, uh, particularly recently, uh, to allow them to do the same work that they were per, uh, permitted to do earlier. Uh, it's just gotten more expensive, and so we, we we're just looking to maintain. Um, their ability to execute those same kinds of jobs. They're typically larger roofing jobs and things like that, that they're fully capable of, of administering um, with their own staff following the requirements, uh, the DAS requirements under the 4B statutes for uh, executing that work. And they use consultants uh, that are vetted by, by us. So uh, we are fully in support of uh, those increases. Um, uh, it just uh, further, uh, there are jobs that are occurring now under the current thresholds that were budgeted and seemed reasonable when they started that now exceed, and then they have to come back to us. And that's not an efficient use of state funds because it slows the process down and drives up costs further. Um, one that's even closer to my heart is the changing of the project definition from $500,000 to $750,000. And what that means for us is the ability to use um, on-call uh, consultant contracts uh, without going through a, um, a, 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 a what we call a formal project procedure where we're going through individual uh, requests for qualifications and the subsequent uh, uh, negotiating on, on a uh, individual um, basis. This by increasing that threshold, um, we're, we're able to reduce our the, the time it takes to get to contract by probably six to nine months. And that has, again, a cost. The, 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 it's the same I said about the thresholds I, uh, for the military and uh, Connecticut State Colleges and Universities it applies also to here. It was 2016 when we last changed those that, that uh, threshold. And um, we, we feel it's it's time to get it um, uh, higher in relation to inflationary pressures. Your three minutes is up, please. Summarize. Okay, then and that and that is the 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 full extent of my of my testimony. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony, Representative Baumgartner. Yes, uh, thank you so much for uh, testifying. I have a question regarding the last section. Um, just given some of the things we've read in the newspaper uh, regarding. Um, uh, DAS with respect to school construction. Um, I was curious as to um, uh, that why that section is uh, why we're looking to raise the threshold. Um, and just to, if you can clarify what an on-call consultant is, I know what, what has been um, alleged is that previously there have been uh, issues where uh, consult, you know, DAS has almost told towns uh, that a consultant uh, they would need to use a certain consultant. Um, and again, this is just based off of, you know, what has been available through um, newspapers. So um, I don't, I don't need, you know, obviously I don't expect you to opine on, on um, any kind of investigation or what have you, but um, if you can just speak to what the rationale for raising that threshold and if that kind of in your eye, um, you know, uh, it, uh, if in your eyes that the most transparent and kind of accountable thing to do. Absolutely. Um, all of the issues that you speak of with the Office of School Construction Grants and, and then specifically, I think, the use of hazardous materials funds were have no relationship to the, to the on-call contracts I'm speaking about. And I'll, I'll explain that. Um, the, the, the contracts that were used for hazardous materials were DAS procurement contracts that are not just available to DAS, but to municipalities and others. The use of those funds was under the control of a different agency when any improprieties occurred. And um, currently now that they're back at DAS, um, there are numerous controls in place for the appropriate use of those funds and monitoring of those funds. I, I, is, is, this is something that I'm that that I am actually involved with. Okay, but that has nothing to do with this threshold increase here. The the, the on call contracts are 
are contracts that that DAS uh, advertises for, competitively selects and issues in a number of different ways. So these are uh, contracts for architects, contracts for various engineering fields, such as a, a civil engineering, landscape architect, and survey. That is one on-call series. Uh, uh, multiple disciplinary engineering, another on-call series. We have several series that are dedicated strictly to minority per, uh, uh, consulting firms, construction administration contracts. Um, these contracts are only available to DAS for use on projects that that we are responsible for administering directly. So uh, it's basically what what is our construction authority when I talk about the 4B statutes is 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 included uh, uh, Connecticut State College the universities, military department. Uh, we do have uh, we do work over certain thresholds for the judicial agency. These are this is work done by our project managers, or we give authority to those agencies based on their technical capacity to use our contracts and follow our procurement procedures. Totally separate from anything that has to do with uh, school construction grants or the hazardous materials funds. I don't know if I you know I can really get into the weeds in this, and I'm sure you're not interested, but but these are very separate issues. All right, th thank you for that clarification. Um, and lastly. Um... This uh, bill, I imagine, is um, kind of functions as a kind of a, a tool to include a lot of different provisions that do impact DAS. Um, and so if you'll uh, just allow me to the liberty to ask a question um, that would not be it's not on, it's part of this bill, but it you know uh, very well could be um, just um, regarding DAS and uh, owning of properties. Um, I know DAS is also one of the largest real estate, um, you know, you know, department, so to speak, in, in um, you know, compared to other departments in Connecticut uh, state, state, um, state government. Um, in uh, where I live in, in southeastern Connecticut, um, we have a lot of uh, older um, proper, you know, uh, older buildings that are on the um, national list of historic uh, uh, registry. Um, and they one building, for example, at Seaside um, was announced that it was slated to be demolished, and that is also a historic structure. And I know you're you're an architect guy, and and also you know DAS. So it's kind of curious as to kind of what touch points would be in DAS, and um, kind of clarifying why why the state could demolish a building that, um, based off of st current statutes and um, you, you know the laws we have, they really shouldn't um, because it is a historic building. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, I'm not only an architect, I'm a preservation architect and a strong advocate for preservation uh, in the state. Uh, before I came to the state, uh, I, uh, I was the architect for the restoration of Gillette Castle as an example, or GA23 in New Haven. Um, so I, I take these issues very seriously. I was also involved since in my tenure at the state, I've been, been the chief architect for about 10 years. Um, with uh, uh, many of the of the earlier discussions, including the uh, SEPA process for Seaside. And so I witnessed uh, that whole process. Um, the, 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 the buildings you're just talking about are magnif were magnificent structures when they were in their prime. They were purpose built as, uh, as a, a sanitarium. Uh, I get mixed up with sanatorium and sanitarium, but sanitarium for for children with tuberculosis when there was no antibiotics to treat children. They figured it would be best to expose them to fresh air and and so on. Um, the state tried uh, initially uh, to give those properties over to uh, the town of Waterford, uh, and for starting, I think, in the early '90s. Uh, th there was never seemed to be getting through the planning process there to make uh, some changes. But, you know, so there's all kinds of things that have gone on. Again, I could get deep into the weeds here. I'm sure you don't want that. But I think from DAS's perspective, we look at every project that's on the national register, state register, or uh, uh, in, in, in compliance with um the state plan of conservation and development, anything that's over 50 years old is allowed to review by the State Historic Preservation Office. We take that very seriously. We invite them in and we talk about things and we look for proper solutions. Sometimes savings, saving buildings isn't 
possible when there's not a demand or adequate use. Clearly, Seaside could have been saved on some level, but it would have required substantial government investment to make, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, a redevelopment into, say, a destination park or whatever possible. And that did not come and doesn't seem to be uh, an option at this point. So I'm not sure if I answered your question, but I can tell you for sh certain that DAS is, is and, and me personally are very interested in historic preservation. All right. Thank you, sir. Sure. And, uh, thank you for your indulgence, Madam Chair. Yes, let's not indulge too often. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Representative Zawistowski, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want a clarification on one item. Um, on the uh, change of on-call um, consultants, is the, the 750000 the pro cost of the project itself or the, the cost of that particular contract? So the 750,000, the definition of project there, as it's referred to in that clause, has to do with the consulting cost only. Um, if it were the project cost, meaning the construction plus the overhead cost, we'd be talking about a small fraction of that for consulting costs. No, it's the amount that we can hire a consultant to. So if you think about you know, so, somehow consultant costs that people for simple math terms, you know, if, if the if the consultant fee is 10% of the construction cost, it represents, you know, up to maybe seven and a half million dollars in construction value. Although, you know, those numbers can move around depending on the complexity of the given job. Thank you. I think the area that I'd probably be concerned about is if you had a threshold of 750000 as a cost of services on a project that cost, for example, $800,000, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be able to um, be, be shortcut the whole bidding process on a project. So I didn't know if there were any parameters that you had um, would recommend on maybe the percentage of, of um, project costs that um, that a uh, contract cost should be. I'm not 100 sure I understand the, the, the question. Okay, if if the if the cost of services uh, to an on-call consultant winds up being 90 percent of your total project costs, mm -hmm. uh, I think we might have a problem with that uh, yeah. because you're talking about um, having somebody do basically a whole project without going out to bid. So, so th these are the design costs or the mm -hmm. oversight costs. This is not the bricks and mortar cost, and I, I can't imagine a situation in in my professional career where where the the, the, the design service would reach that level, ninety percent. I mean, at ten percent, that's high. Our fees are typically in the six to nine percent of construction bricks and mortar. So this specifically deals only with design, only with consulting costs. Consult, design consulting costs, yes. Design, or we have we hire construction administrators we use mm -hmm. on those. We do studies, but none of this is... The, 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 all procurement of bricks and mortar follows a different path. And, and, and it could be on, uh, depending on, on the dollar value, uh, it could be off of uh, a state... You know, the DAS contracts for 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 labor labor contracts over a certain threshold, then we get into either bidding work or hiring construction managers to to bid the sub trades. But no, none of none of this money is buying stuff to go in build or go into buildings. Purely. Consulting. Okay, appreciate the clarification. Sure. Thank you. Okay, last call. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing no other questions, thank you so much. Thank have you. a good afternoon. Up next, we have Andrea Dunn, followed by Maria Weingarten. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee and the senators and representatives that are present. Um, I'm attorney Andrea Dunn. I'm providing testimony regarding raised bill number 6805, in particular paragraph G regarding the solar roof panel systems. Um, within single family homes within a common interest community. I'm the vice chair of the Connecticut chapter of the Community Actions Institute Legislative Action Committee. I'm also a condominium associations attorney representing hundreds of associations throughout the state of Connecticut. 
We are in support of this bill and are working with Representative Curry on providing clarifying language similar to the language that was in SB4 um, with regard to the EV charging stations. Um, we're trying to make it that we'll work with our um, condominium associations across the state. Um, as with the EV charging station legislation in SB4, there is a need to provide a roadmap for associations in the application after the passage of the bill. I've been receiving numerous phone calls um, within the last couple of months regarding solar roof panels, asking me how it all works. Um, with regard to the last, with the language in SB4, for this reason, it's necessary to have the clarifying language to assist the board members and the unit owners regarding the topic. Um, clean energy and alternative energy sources are at the forefront in the state. And for some of my community members, fear kind of plays into um, some of the resistance to change. For some people, it's more of an aesthetics and personal preference for how they envision the look of their community, while for others, the cost is a factor. And while they may be supportive of a neighbor installing solar panels on their roof, they certainly do not want to pay for them. This is why it's essential to clarify the responsibilities while staying in line with the governing documents of an association and the Common Interest Ownership Act. While we're speaking of standalone single family dwellings, it needs to be understood that not every association is the same. And while some use the lot lines as unit boundaries, making the unit owner responsible for the entire lot and everything within it, others have the inner walls of the home as the boundary with the association being responsible for maintenance, repair and replacement of the roofs as they are defined as a common element. Making application of this legislation a little bit tricky without some clarification. There's also always insurance requirements to consider. My colleague, Dave uh, Pilon from Bouvier Insurance will be testifying later. I'll let him deal with insurance as I always do. Um, that's my testimony. I would just like to thank Representative Curry for working with our uh, organization on the issues. Thank you so much for your testimony. And I really appreciate this because clarifying language is always helpful. And uh, I think we definitely had some questions on our end of the committee trying to figure out exactly how we if we'd already accomplished this or if we needed to put in a further bill to accomplish this. I do see Senator Fazio has a question for you. Yeah, and to echo our um, our, our chair, I, I think the ultimate question is, um, is how this is compatible or incompatible with SB4 and what specific languages. But I was curious that it, it sounded like your testimony uh, provided a lot of good reasons why we might not need to pass this because in the first place, most condominium uh, owners uh, and cooperatives are in favor of the de deployment of solar when it's appropriate um, and that they're flexible. Uh, and uh, so so it, it becomes, you know, and, and that there also is need for some, uh, you know, for the flexibility in the rare cases where, where, um, uh, where it doesn't work or there might be some idiosyncratic concern, um, which, it, which, and we haven't even gone down the, the, path of discussing the fact that a lot of these um, solar arrays, residential solar arrays are um, in a huge backlog of being interconnected to the, the electricity grid. But, you know, if most are already in favor of deploying it and there's probably, you know, uh, only a few stragglers, why would we need to, to have a statewide um, policy um, forcing it? I think, well, there is, I think the clarification needs to be made in this raised bill or maybe tack it on to SB4, but the problem is um, the applicant, like we need the roadmap because in, in the initial legislation in SB4, it was just planned unit communities. And I have a lot of condominiums that essentially are planned unit communities where they're, they have standalone single family homes, but they don't call themselves. And in their declarations, they are condominiums. So there's always gonna be people looking for the loopholes. And I think the intent of this legislation is to limit it to those situations where we have a single family dwelling that's not sharing its roof with anyone else. You know, Cause in those instances, why not? If, if that unit owner wants to have the solar panels, you know, have this process for them to do so. They're not sharing their roof with anyone. It's their, like their limited common element, basically their roof and their roof alone. But the clarification, I think, is needed because many people don't realize, you know, I do have some that where the lot lines are the unit boundaries. That's easy. 
makes it much easier. Then I have others where it, it's just like a condominium where they say the inner surface of the wall is where the unit boundary ends and the common elements begin. So then you have that question of, okay, well, this is a common element now. It's not part of the unit. So what are we doing? What are we saying here now? Is the association going to have to take on the extra costs involved in this? Or is it the unit owner only? Whereas with the EV charging stations, we made it unit owner responsibility. And we laid it out for them, that, that piece of legislation, which um, we worked with Senator ha former Senator Haskell on that. Um, I think that has the roadmap. I mean, people really need that from a statute. They need to see, okay, how does this work? Because they're calling me right now on the solar panels. They're like, well, what do I do? And and I'm like, well, you know, is it this? Is it that? You know, whereas we have that specific language in SB4 that says this is what the unit owner is responsible for. This is how they're going to go about doing this. They're going to, uh, you know, apply to the board. They're going to, and they're, you're going to have to get insurance. You're going to have to pay for this, that, and the other thing. And I, I think it there is some clarification that needs to be done here because they really need that. I mean, people, it quells the fears too if they have in writing from the legislature, like this is this is what this bill is and this is what you're going to have to do. I think it helps yeah. immensely with people. It really does. Yeah. And I, and I totally hear what you're saying about being clear and delineating responsibility, liability, cost, et cetera. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I don't know that I'm totally sold on the prohibition uh, or the mandate or whatever you want to call it, but you're, and just, sorry, just a quick last question. Are, is your concern the shared roofs or the standalone well, that was kind of one of the other questions too, is like the shared the shared roof is, you know, what a lot of people are like, what is that? And my understanding is we need to make it clear that this is just the situation where you have a single family dwelling that doesn't, it's all by itself. It's not yeah, sharing, sure. you know, and I think that clarification, because people do, you know, even though it's supposed to be clear, <laughs> people always have that question to me. They're like, what's that? I don't know what that is. And I'm like, well, you know, what do you think it is? So I think it goes a long way to getting these kind of initiatives going. If we have the legislation that's like, okay, don't, don't, freak, don't freak out communities. This is what it's about. And, and it gives the unit owner that freedom to say, okay, I want to do these solar panels, something I want to do. And then the board and the association can say, okay, well, this is the process and let's get into it. Um, and it makes it, it quells those fears of people are always afraid you're taking something from them. You're taking something away. So I think if we clarify, it would be a much easier um, way for us to explain to our communities, you know, their responsibilities. All right. Thank you for your time. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. Seeing no other questions at this time. Thank you for your testimony. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Maria Weingarten. Next, with Michael Maglaris on deck. Maria, are you with us? I'm not seeing you. Okay. All right. Next up, Michael Maglaris. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Uh, you are. That's close enough, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> good. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Mike Maglaris, and I am the superintendent of Connecticut Foundation Solutions Indemnity Company. And that's a mouthful, Madam Chair, so we call it CIFSIC for short, C-F-S-I-C. Uh, we started our operations as CIFSIC on January 10, 2019. We didn't really get off the ground, no pun intended, until the middle of March of 19. And so we are coming up on our third anniversary. And since that time, we have issued 1,035 participation agreements. That's a document that binds CIFSIC to replace a foundation, a crumbling foundation for an individual homeowner in the affected area. As of this morning at nine o'clock with a home in Suffield, we have replaced 703 foundations and put 703 families back into safe and secure homes and restored each one of those homes to the tax basis of the towns that are in sore need of tax revenue in question. I'm delighted to be able to speak in support of SB 43. I'm following Senator Anwar, Sada, uh, Anwar and Senator uh, and Representative Foster, and, and they have already made some, uh, some really good and, and articulate comments. There is uh, information in the public testimony that is specifically aimed, very specifically aimed point by point, on potential wording 
for elements within SB 43 that would uh, go a long way, we think, to ending the crumbling foundations crisis. I'm gonna say that again, ending the crumbling foundations crisis. Since I undertook this task uh, in January of 2019, Madam Chair, I felt I felt a little bit from time to time like a surgeon. What's been happening is <clears throat> I've been on call to do surgeries, people who are infected with, with, with tumors, the way that crumbling foundations are an infection in our state. And I have operated 703 times. But there is a point where we have to ask ourselves, why so many operations, why so many tumors, why so much state funds uh, being expended? Uh, it is because we have not yet begun to address the front end part of the problem, which any good surgeon would ask. Too many people, too many operations, how do I prevent it? Too many crumbling foundations, how do I prevent it? The material within our testimony, my written testimony, with specific examples of quality improvement measures that can be made, will we think go a long way to ending this crisis and enabling these towns and these homeowners to get back on their feet. My job as superintendent, Madam Chair, is to put SIPSIC out of business. I want no, that day to come. Up, please summarize. Uh, I want that day to come and I welcome questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Representative Delnicki. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And Mike, it's good to see you there. And I want to thank you for the presentation that you gave to the uh, Crumbling Foundation Caucus back in, I think it was December, wasn't it? I think January. Uh, January. Nikki, yes. So going over the presentation that you had given, uh, first, I'm going to ask a very global question and then some specific questions. If all of the recommendations that you had given in, in a, the presentation at that meeting in January had gone into effect prior to the first foundation that had failed, do you think we'd be in a different situation now with virtually no issues pertaining to pyrotite damaging foundations? No, but you would not have needed to give me to date more than $180 million. The number would be somewhere, I think, south of 25 to 30 million. And that would be all that was needed. So the straight answer to the question is if the measures that are embedded or the points that are embedded, Rep. Delnicki, in the written testimony that I've put forward to support SB 43, had been in place for residential foundation placements in 2015 and 16, you and I wouldn't be talking right now. And if we would, it would be a much scaled down version of this captive. And, and Mike, I'd like to take a moment to um, just ask you the pertinence of the various recommendations you made. The, uh, the first one, of course, being the cement source type and mill report. Uh, yes, it, I would answer that question if I could in a general way, which is in, in, we, we, did a, we did a study, as you know, Rep. Delnicki, because we presented the findings to you and others in the conference. We took a look at 100 public use buildings in the affected, the top 10 affected towns with this crisis. You'll recall that we were able to allocate by statute $175,000 of our budget. It wasn't new funds, it was our existing budget to examine the extent of non-residential building problems with this crisis in the top 10 towns, the top 10 towns are 91% of where our claimants are. After a review, a strenuous review, a 408 page report, the conclusion that I came to as superintendent was that this crisis did not extend to buildings that I would call commercial or public use buildings. Very important conclusion. We could have gone on, Rep. Delnicki, with another 50 or another 100 and expended all of our 175. I stopped the process at this point, at that point, returned $57,000 of that allocation to our budget. And as you know, we watch our budget very carefully. We're allowed upwards of 10% of our annual revenues to manage this company. Uh, on, on an audited basis since inception, we've utilized 3.9% of our funds for that purpose. So we're very vigilant about returning funds. 
that what is the conclusion we came to? Very important. A commercial concrete pour, a commercial foundation mix is radically different and it is radically different in important ways from a residential foundation mix. If we adopt a handful of upfront quality improvement measures with respect to pouring a home foundation that we steal from the commercial placement business, we will eventually eliminate this crisis. And what's my position and my board's position? We have to eliminate the crisis. I can't continue to be a surgeon operating on 703 patients with another 2000 behind that group and not ask the question, when does this stop and how do we fix it? Now, I'm not gonna go through each individual item in the recommendations, but I, I do wanna ask a pertinent question pertaining to the documentation of the delivery ticket that you would want to have as part of that concrete pour and what that delivery ticket should do and how it should protect the project, the home foundation from any possible failure due to pyrotite or due to crumbling. Uh, could you just address that? Yes, of course, I'd be happy to. And thank you for the question. Uh, I'll give you an analogy, Reptel Nikki. You uh, drop off some shirts and a couple of suits and whatever at the dry cleaners, you get a ticket. That ticket is proof that those garments were left at the dry cleaners on a certain day and what the cost is. And when you return, you produce that ticket and there's a reconciliation that you left eight shirts and two suits and a sweater and whatever, and you pay for that transaction and walk away with documentation of what you left and documentation of what you have. The delivery ticket, which verifies the concrete mix design submittal is exactly what's needed here. The, the mantra with this crisis since day one is accountability, accountability, accountability. Who's at fault for this crisis that the commercial insurance market refuses to address? 703 claimants to date with homes that have been replaced by SIFSIC. Each one of those on a mandatory basis, Rep. Del Nicky, has had to apply to their commercial insurance company and be declined. It's a terrible crisis. So the straight answer is in the commercial poor, when that driver shows up with his load, the contractor checks that ticket and verifies that it's exactly the, the mixture that was ordered, exactly the strength that was required, and they actually compares notes, accountability. So it's the same way that you walk into the dry cleaners with that ticket and say, yeah, I did leave 11 shirts and you only gave me 10. It is the same concept. That's not happening, happening in a residential poor. SB 43 would mandate that and we would go a long way to making sure that proper techniques are used for the elimination of pyrotite and for the correct uh, manufacture of concrete going into residential foundations. The complaint's been raised. Won't this raise the cost of construction? The complaints been raised, won't this delay construction? It won't delay it. Would it add some expense to do initial uh, construction on residential homes uh, in our part of the world? The answer is perhaps it would, but I wanna be clear. At some point, you and your fellow elected officials, Governor Lamont and others will turn to me as Governor Lamont did in February, the month after his first inauguration. Governor Lamont said to me, Mike, I'm going to give you your money, but you better find a fix. Uh, we found a fix. It's SB 43. Well, I thank you for your commentary there. And just as an aside, uh, at the Metropolitan District, where I worked for 32 years, I, I ran a parking garage renovation project. And that kind of documentation pertaining to the concrete, where the aggregate came from, et cetera, was provided by the company, the purveyor of the concrete, and a guarantee that uh, the delivery of the concrete would meet the appropriate PSI, et cetera. Uh, one thing that I don't know was touched on here, and I just want to follow up with that, and then I think I'm going to uh, allow anyone else that's interested in asking a question an opportunity. 
aggregate. Uh, have there been issues with aggregate that you were able to determine based on your uh, your your analysis? Uh, based on, on our report, you mean the one we did? Correct. Right. Uh, the, the straight answer is uh, yes, but you have addressed, the straight answer is yes, but you have addressed that and, and addressed it in a very fine way, an initial way, in, in Public Act 21-120, which we applaud at SIFSIC and my board of directors and I are unanimous on this point. And remember that my board includes four ex officio elected officials and one person appointed by the governor with a broad, a broad board of directors uh, managing this private company. Uh, we think that 21120 is a superb start, along with SB 43, because 21120 mandates, of course, the, the approved uh, use of, uh, of aggregate that has been tested appropriately. The one little loophole, or one thing we want to close, Rep Delnicki, is that all aggregate must be tested. As you and I drive by 84 or down 91, we see uh, roadways that have been cut out of sheer uh, 180 uh, to, to 200 feet of square rock. And we'll see orange and red oxidation on that rock. That's pyrotite. That aggregate is not coming from a quarry, it's coming from construction. We must make sure in 21120. Uh, Rep. Delnicki, that, that that bill is modified, that that act is modified, to force function the testing of all aggregate, even if it doesn't come from a quarry. If we take that measure, and we take the quality improvement measures in SB 43, we put them together, and we link arms on those two issues, we've got a way to lick this crisis by 2030 and put SIFSIC out of business, which I dearly want to do. Well, I certainly uh, appreciate everything you've done here. Thank you. And uh, I, I think it makes a tremendous amount of success uh, apparent in what you've done. Uh, and I, lastly, uh, the issue of aggregate, you're spot on. And we, we need to hold, whether it's a purveyor of concrete for a commercial building, whether it's a purveyor of concrete for a residential home, to a standard where we will never have this issue again. And hopefully, with all due respect, we have an opportunity to put CIFSIC out of business, having had a tremendous run of success and over 700 homes being restored to use by the homeowner who now can sleep sound at night is something yes. to be proud of. Here, here, here. And if I may add a comment with your permission and the chairs, um, Everything that I just mentioned is up on our website. We are completely transparent about all matters, including our four audited financials. This model, CIFSIC, Rep. Del Delnicki, a captive insurance company licensed under Connecticut captive statutes, funded with taxpayer dollars, but CIFSIC itself being a private corporation, a tax exempt, managed by an independent board of directors. This public-private partnership, taxpayer funds given to a private company to administer a program is a model for the nation and Rep Delnicki, it's a model for the world. What you may not know and other members of the committee might not know is that in my industry, the captive insurance industry, we are written up as a textbook example of a public-private partnership. In fact, in Washington now, what is under consideration is the CIFSIC model for the insuring of terrorism coverage in the future. Federal funds, private corporation. So what you have achieved here in Connecticut, you and your colleagues, and everyone who've supported these, uh, this issue, including some strong activists who've made their point and made it well, you, you, you have succeeded beyond your dreams. The question is when uh, we put this company out of business uh, and I look forward to that day. Well, thank you, Mike. And I, I want to emphasize how this is truly a situation where we can highlight how government has done something very, very good to help the people out that have become victims put their lives back together, enjoy their homes, put the homes back on the tax rolls. Cities and towns that have the crumbling foundation issue, they basically lost the value of that home, that building, and could not tax it appropriately. And now they can, as these homes are put back on the tax rolls, people's lives are restored back to normal. And again, 
It's a highlight and a high point for what we have been able to do here. Thank you, uh, Mr. McLaris, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Delnicki. And seeing no other questions at this time, thank you so much for your testimony and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Up next, we have Chris Edge from the town of Berlin and Alexis Harrison on deck. Thank you very much. Oh, Mr. Edge. Senator Roman, Representative uh, Avros de Gras, uh, Senator Fazio, Representative Zulo, Senator Needleman, Representative Chaffee, and distinguished members of the Planning and Development Committee. I'm the Economic Development Director for the town of Berlin, and I'm speaking today on Bill 6394. This bill, which is important to a community like Berlin and others, is a wonderful addition to the huge effort that the state of Connecticut has undertaken with CT rail line connecting Springfield to New Haven and beyond. The ability of communities such as Berlin, Newington, Wallingford, West Hartford, and others to have the same benefits as a distressed municipality, care of funding or cost sharing programs may not merit bear immediate fruit, but in the long term, this could be the difference between a project not being viable, being market ready, and be built near our train stations. I believe this piece of legislation is especially important today as the cost of construction has increased with a double challenge of higher interest rates. In Berlin, we chose to partner with a developer out of Southington for a transit-oriented development, and in doing so, have succeeded in bringing local, private, and state funding to bear to make it happen. One of the keys part of this project to make it bankable was increasing dense housing density by the Berlin train station from eight units per acre up to 26 units an acre. The developer, Newport Realty Group, will be providing over 20% of the total square footage as commercial space facing our downtown of Farmington Avenue. In fact, our first major tenant, Hop House Gastro Pub, will open their third location in mid-April this year at Nine Steel Boulevard, the first building in the Steel Center development. With the cooperation and hard work of State of Connecticut, including four different agencies, Newport Realty Group and the town of Berlin, we were able to make this a reality. In fact, I'd like to extend a personal invitation to all of you to come to Berlin to see how, when all parties see the end goal and work closely to get their great things can happen. Make it more fun, we can always tour the area, end up at Coles Road Brewing, which is within one-tenth of a mile of the train station. Thank you very much for your time and consideration of Bill 6394 and its possible effect to uh, affect those towns with transit station. Thank you so much for your testimony. Always nice to see one of my constituents. Not, not necessarily live, but at least uh, as live as we can be, right? Uh, I, I, I did all day Monday there, and it's nice, nice to see people back up at the Capitol. <laughs> uh, I don't see any questions at this time, but uh, you'll see we do have more transit-oriented development bills coming before us in the next few weeks, so hopefully we'll see you again. Very good. Thank you so much. Everyone Thanks. have a great day and a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Uh, Alexis Harrison, are you with us by any chance? I am not seeing you in our Zoom room. So up next, we have Randy Collins from CCM, please. Good afternoon, uh, members of the Planning and Development Committee. Uh, my name is Randy Collins uh, with the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities. Uh, CCM has submitted testimony on uh, most of the bills, I think, on the agenda. Um, uh, the testimony is submitted by Donna Hamzy Karocha. I'm just trying to fill in for her today. I um, just wanted to comment on a few bills quickly, um, be brief in my time. Uh, we support the Senate Bill, or Senate Bill 506 and 519, uh, which uh, addresses uh, solar taxation and where we have those projects that are five megawatt and over that are being subdivided to escape um, local property taxation. Um, it certainly wasn't the intent of the law when they created that five megawatt threshold uh, to go before to plan a five megawatt and then go two, two and one uh, as a workaround. So we support uh, 506 and 519, uh, slightly different language, but the intent is the same. And uh, if that bill is raised, uh, we look forward to working with the committee on, on specific language. Um, we also support 6293 uh, regarding the siting of solar uh, facilities. Uh, quite often our municipalities, not just related to solar, have concerns with uh, where they feel they don't have a strong voice at the, sol at the siting council um, and that this would uh, allow the siting of sol solar facilities to be consistent with their plans of conservation and development. There are a number of options I think we could look at. I, testified in the Commerce Committee uh, yesterday um, on State Historic and Preservation Office. And if a municipality felt aggrieved uh, that there would be an appeal process outside of cost of litigation that would go that case to the commissioner of DECD. So there's options that we can look at to provide, as I said, other options outside of cost of litigation, which many of our towns simply can't afford. 
Uh, we support Senate Bill or House Bill 6556 regarding legal notices. Uh, this has long been a priority for CCM. It's an unfunded mandate that our towns continue to, to pay for. And while, you know, in the overall budget for some municipalities, it may not be significant numbers. Uh, any relief we can get from, um, you know, the unfunded mandates that we do face would be welcome. Uh, I think this is one of the few pieces that we saw in the governor's proposed budget. Uh, and we certainly want to keep pace with simply what the state is doing. They've moved to online and regulations are posed online, but municipalities are still kind of beholden to uh, the system. Um, you know, a couple other things just wanted to quickly uh, raise concerns. Um, I think the one I wanted to ask about was the 5868 allowing fire districts to, uh, uh, or no, it was, um, I'm sorry, 6804 allowing fire districts to assess, you know, levy assessment on uh, or user fees. Um, would we support the idea of, of looking at user fees as a broader idea of revenue diversification? The idea of allowing individual a fire district to impose that user fee could have wider ramifications beyond just that district. I know um, Yale New Haven has a, you know, Yale has a significant contribution they make, and you know, I'm not going to argue if the number's right or wrong, but that they make to the city of New Haven. And you could potentially see a fire district saying, well, we're going to charge user fee. Well, if you're going to charge user fee, I'm no longer going to make this. Um, so as I said, the idea of user fees, especially for a lot of taxes and properties, which might consume a lot of municipal resources, should be done by the, the, the local elected body uh, and understanding the full ramifications. So as I said, we've submitted a number of other bills, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Seeing no questions at this time, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Chris Vandehoof and Poya Jeremy next. I hope I said that right. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Chris Vandehoof. I am, uh, among many things around here, the executive director of the Connecticut Daily Newspaper Association. Uh, you already heard from Mike DeLuca, who is the group publisher of Hearst. Uh, and so I just wanted to come up and, and clarify a couple of things, um, specific uh, questions that were brought up, frankly. Uh, Representative Del Nicky asked uh, a question about um, thumbing through the newspaper. Uh, years ago, as uh, my good friend Randy just mentioned, this has been an ongoing issue for a number of years. Uh, the newspapers agreed uh, across the state to put the public notices and classifieds in its index on the front page. Um, additionally, uh, Madam Chair, you referenced Hearst as a global corporation. In Connecticut alone, however, Hearst employs 225 people as offices in eight different uh, towns, but across Connecticut, independent of Hearst, uh, there are newspapers in the state that are independently owned and family owned. The Journal Inquirer in Manchester is family owned, uh, the Rep Ham and Waterbury is family owned, the Meriden Record Journal is family owned, and down in Representative Baumgartner's district, district, New London Day is actually owned by a public trust. Uh, so I do appreciate the discussion in the past about the size of Hearst, of course, uh, with Alden buying the Hartford Current. That was a major issue last year. I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, but generally speaking, across the state, the newspapers are uh, uh, operated independently. And, and finally, on the issue of legal notices specifically, the overall key to this uh, is that transparency in town government uh, that is independent of itself. Uh, does cost some money and we appreciate that. However, it's a service that is provided to towns and cities to rely on online self uh, public notice is not transparent nor independent. And we are all aware of uh, issues throughout Connecticut and across the country uh, where lack of transparency has led to problems. Um, the internet is simply not a reliable and secure avenue for independent transparency. Uh, and we would urge uh, the committee to reject this bill. But as Mike also said earlier, Madam Chair and members, you know. We are always open to, to working with the committee. We're certainly open to working with CCM and, and, and Randy and the team over there as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I am not seeing any questions at this time. Great, thank you. Have, Have a good afternoon. Weekend. Okay, uh, Poya Jeremy, not seeing you as of now, okay. Moving on, Leslie Blateau and Noel Lafayette after that. Leslie, I'm not seeing you either. Not in the Zoom room, Noel Lafayette. Related to the Lafayette? <laughs> not in the Zoom, not here either. Okay, David Pylon, you're up. Thanks for being here. Wow, okay. 
I haven't finished my testimony yet. <laughs> okay, no, just kidding. First of all, thank you for uh, for having me, Madam Chair, and the distinguished members of the Planning and Development Committee uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is David Pilon. Uh, I am a Community Association Insurance and Risk Management Specialist at Bouvier Insurance in West Hartford and a delegate of the Legislative Action Committee for the Community Association Institute's Connecticut chapter. And I'm speaking today in support of uh, House Bill 6805 regarding solar panel installations on roofs of single family homes within private community associations. My colleague Andrea Dunn spoke earlier and did a good job of outlining our stance. So I will be brief, but one of the key issues that we have found with respect to legislation such as this is the need for a roadmap, as we call it, for community association uh, boards to to or guidelines for, for these private communities and their board members to follow as it pertains to introducing this type of technology, um, you know, such as installing solar panels, electric vehicle charging stations, et cetera, into the, you know, in bringing them into the communities. Um, and in listening to Andrea's testimony earlier, the question came up, I think it was from Senator Fazio regarding the need for this type of legislation. And I do, I just wanted to address that briefly because we do see a, a pretty significant uh, amount of pushback on the desire to allow these um, solar panels, we'll call it solar panels on the roofs, for instance, in this case, into private communities because the boards don't know how to handle it from a risk management standpoint. Uh, the risk profile of the community could change, the exposure, and for me, from an insurance standpoint, there could be all sorts of potential um, impacts depending on the declarations and the specific information in the declaration of that particular community. For instance, uh, in some communities, single family homes, they, they, their insurance can be either in one direction, it could be the unit owner insures the entire building, and they have to cover it if there's a loss to the other side of the spectrum where even though they're single family homes as part of a community, private community, that private community covers the insurance for those single family homes. And in those instances, these boards are, are in need of some guidance as to what rules and parameters they can put around the installation of, in this case, the installation of solar panels so that they don't have, they don't see their risk profile of their community go in, in one direction or another such that they could even have trouble getting insurance uh, should there be a loss associated with this. So our goal is to provide clarifying language in this bill that helps each community based on their specific, uh, I will call it demographic situation as it pertains to the, to the uh, requirements within their declarations so that they have that roadmap regardless of which area, end of the spectrum they're on. From a risk management standpoint, so they don't have to worry about a losing insurance, b losing control of the of of you know the the, the risk management or risk profile of the community, uh, and still being able to allow for us to move on in the times where the declarations themselves don't necessarily introduce or address these uh, the new technologies that are being developed. Your uh, three minutes are up. Please summarize. I'm done. Thank you for your testimony. Appreciate it. Well, great job for not being finished. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I am seeing no questions at this time. Thank you for your testimony and have a wonderful weekend. You as well. Thank you. Up next, we have Abigail Roth, followed by Andrew Gearing. Hopefully I'm saying that correctly. Hi. Um, thank you so much for holding this hearing and listening to my testimony. I wanted to briefly um, make some points that um, highlight some points I made in my written testimony of House Bill 5353, an act concerning certain municipal traffic authorities. This bill will advance Connecticut's Vision Zero goal of eliminating traffic deaths and serious injuries and making our streets safer for all road users. Connecticut and New Haven, where I live, are experiencing an epidemic of traffic violence. More than one person a day was killed in traffic violence in the state last year, which is unacceptable. Given the critical role road design plays in traffic safety, we in New Haven and other large municipalities need a traffic authority with expertise in street infrastructure design. This bill would enable that to happen. Currently, the state's definition, statutory definition of traffic authority is hard to decipher, and it's not clear if, if a municipality with a, with a police commission is required to house its traffic authority there. House Bill 5353 would make clear that municipalities with populations of 50,000 or more 
don't have to house their traffic authorities in the police commission. In New Haven, as in, as in many municipalities, that is where the police, the traffic authority is housed. It's not logical, a logical location for a traffic authority because police commissions have lots of other things to worry about and the design of our streets is not their top priority. They generally don't have any background or training, let alone expertise in transportation planning, engineering, or traffic safety infrastructure. Candidates for police commission are selected by a mayor based on their expertise and experience in traditional policing issues. And when our Board of Alders in New Haven vets them in the confirmation process, they ask questions related to policing, not road infrastructure design. Again, this bill would change this and enable those making key decisions about improvements to our streets to have expertise about street design, safety, and sustainability. The timing of this bill is helpful to New Haven. Safe streets advocates are seeking to amend our charter to establish an independent traffic commission separate from the police commission. This bill would make clear that New Haven and other large cities are empowered to make this change. Please pass this bill to help reduce the alarming increase in traffic, traffic fatalities and injuries in Connecticut and bolster the state's commitment to Vision Zero. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony, Ms. Roth. I have one question for you, Representative Bungartner, maybe more. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your testimony on this uh, bill, uh, Ms. Roth. Uh, just one question. Um, I know you highlighted New Haven um, and its uh, kind of governance structure with respect to uh, traffic authorities. Um, I was curious if you ha have heard from other municipalities regarding uh, similar issues that you've been dealing with. Well, th thank you for your question. I know certainly the town of Hamden, um, the mayor spoke today and that their delegation was all are the people who sponsored this bill. So that certainly is an issue there. And I think um, this is structured so that it wouldn't be required, but it would give the opportunity for those municipalities for whom that was something that they thought made sense. And I am, um, although I don't know for sure, I am guessing given um, that the reasons I gave that sort of you want people with expertise in traffic planning to be making those decisions that the same issues would um, exist in other in other municipalities. Thank you. And uh, as a member of the Groton Town Council uh, last year, uh, led the effort to implement a complete streets um, policy through um, um, as, a, as a policy and uh, as a result, our traffic authority in Groton, it's chaired by our town manager and police chief, uh, and they are, and that is per uh, our town charter. Um, in, in Stonington, we have a police commission that also serves as the traffic authority, so it would be impacted by this bill. But I was curious to hear your thoughts on expanding the bill or the scope to ensure that um, it would uh, other communities outside of communities that just have uh, police commissions could benefit from such a, a reform. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I would, I'd be all for expanding it um, in ways um, that help communities ensure that they have people with expertise in traffic planning beyond, beyond those, in those traffic authorities and traffic commissions. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Roth. Thank you so much for your testimony. Seeing no other, oh, sorry, Senator Fazio. <laughs> I'll be quick. Ms. Roth, yeah. if you're still there. Yeah, I'll be quick and I don't have a question, but uh, I, we've seen a significant rise in traffic fatalities in the state uh, and elsewhere across the nation. Um, I don't think, uh, I don't think it's any surprise that it's been, uh, it, it, it's been highly correlated with the decline of traffic stops. Um, and obviously if there is a lower likelihood of seeing consequences for reckless driving, um, and for bad behavior on the road, then there's going to be more of it. And so ensuring that we have the proactive policing of our highways and of our roads and that there isn't reckless driving, there isn't excessive speeding, uh, then that would go a long way to saving lives and reducing traffic fatalities back to the level that they were seen even in 2019. I mean, the numbers of traffic fatalities in just the past few years compared to before 2020 is really, really striking, especially because there's fewer people on the road since the pandemic, less commuting. Um, so I don't think it should be, um, I think we need the context as well. And I'm not speaking for or against this bill necessarily, just to be clear, but I do wanna add that context that I think we should all remember that if we have proactive policing of our highways and our streets, um, if we have consequences for reckless driving and speeding, uh, then we are going to see um, fewer lives lost um, on the road. So I just want to add that context to the conversation. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Yeah, I very much appreciate that. I testified in favor of um, House Bill 5917, the Vision Zero Bill, and I think automated enforcement, quite frankly, is critical if we're going to change what's happening. Um, we don't have enough police to be enforcing in person. And so I very much hope you're absolutely right. This is one small piece of the puzzle, but um, we need both improved infrastructure and more enforcement. So thank you. Thank you both so much. Officially seeing no other questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Have a nice weekend. Uh, we are going to go back to Noel Lafayette, please. Welcome, Mr. Lafayette. Good morning. How are you? Afternoon, I should say. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak today, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm here on behalf of a Connecticut SSA, uh, also formerly known as Solar Connecticut Trade Association. Uh, we've been in existence for well over a decade. I have been a solar developer for 15 years. I was one of the first in the state, and it used to be very lonely. Now it's very crowded. So in any case, I'm here to comment on three bills, HB 6293, an act concerning solar farms. Uh, in, in interest of the time and it just as this bill basically is asking for municipal government to usurp the siting council uh, essentially is move these projects away from the siting council into local government. Um, the siting council has done a pretty good job for the last seven or eight years on striking balance. I see no dramatic need to shift that if it's not broke don't fix it. Okay, so that works quite well and I can tell you as a developer, they are feared. We are well prepared before we go in front of the siting council, so it's no rubber stamp. And um, sometimes their additions and suggestions can be quite expensive, but we follow them. So we just see no reason for this bill. I did hear uh, Representative Foster speak on this earlier, and I do understand her frustration. <clears throat> we can't even say how what shrubs you're going to plant to screen it from the neighbor, that sort of thing. And she's it's not an unreasonable idea. The, the problem is someone who's been all over the state in front of lots of planning boards is those conversations, unfortunately, more often than not, drift into unreasonable territory. You know, comments like, well, if you give us the power for free, we'll do it. OK, so not that to demonize everybody, but it, more often than not. So it's really even though I empathize with uh, Representative Foster's point of view, it, it's in reality, it just doesn't play out that way. Sad to say. So moving along from that, um, SB 506, Solar Connecticut Con SSA has, has not heard or seen any documentation of this type of gaming of the system. We hear a lot of hearsay. Um, I've heard some stories today and in other committees throughout the week. There's a lot of things that don't make sense. But as an organization from its, our very inception, we have worked with Pura, we have worked with Eversource, we have worked with UI, and we have worked with the ET committee that any time a situation of gaming arises, we move quickly to fix it. Uh, as a trade association, we seek a level playing field. So when there's a couple of bad apples who game the system, the system reacts. We're part of that dialogue, and we help those entities that I listed fix the problem. So even though, so in spirit, if this kind of behavior is occurring, we do not support it, and we're inclined to support this bill. Uh, right now, though, the facts seem to be kind of hearsay around, oh, I heard about this project or that project, this or that. A lot of mixing of dialogue, so it's hard to say. But if it is happening, this bill should be passed to because we support any gaming of the system of any kind is bad for the industry, and we've always fought for that. So thank Your you three minutes that. is up. Please summarize your testimony. I'm sorry? Okay, SB 519, um, here's the, we're gonna break this into two parts, really fast. One to five megawatts, the uniform capacity tax as in Rhode Island is effective, the five uh, dollars per megawatt. After that, you get into much larger projects and we've heard of them, some of them today. Those projects are all deep procurements deep ran those RFPs and chose the winners. So it appeared to me, rather than convolute the conversation from here, a constructive dialogue between your committee and Commissioner Dykes should be had. Any further RFPs on very large projects put forward by DEEP should have a tax formula in the RFP 
it levels the playing field for everybody. So that's a constructive conversation on six megawatts and up, which to me seems reasonable. As a developer, if I know what I'm going to be taxed, it's going to be in my bid. Your right. three minutes is up. Please summarize Thank you. your testimony. My apologies. I just had to get that out. Thank you very much. I'll start with a question. So regarding the people gaming or not gaming the system, have you not personally or the association been involved in specifically what was talked about, about a 10 project going to a two, 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 you know, project? Have you encountered that and, and what has happened? Yes. And I'm going to refrain from naming names, so I don't want to get myself in trouble. But two years ago, a developer uh, broke a large project into 10 small ones. But it wasn't to game the taxes because everything was exempt. And that's what I'm talking about, confusion. What they were trying to do is the small ZREC bucket at the time was the highest. So he wanted to get 10 small ZREC contracts instead of one large one. So he was trying to play the ZREC aspect of the game, not the tax game. And so when people, I mean, most of the stuff is exempt anyway. So I'm not seeing the tax motivation to do that. But so somebody might be confusing when the story gets retold multiple times, but that's something the entire association was livid um, that developers having a hard time these days. Uh, but we worked with Pura and with the ET committee and Eversource to close that loophole and it hasn't happened again. And just to, to follow up on that, I, I know um, we had the first selectman from, I think it was North Stonington talking about losing out on nearly $300,000 of taxes. Was he... It sounds maybe they were comparing apples and oranges. I'm just trying to understand the project he was talking about. It did seem like they were missing out on tax revenue based on the dividing up of the project. That would be correct. And and so we're not against taxation. What we're against is this constant ambivalent moving target, uh, depending on the size of the system, depending on who's buying the power, depending. It's very difficult. So Solar Connecticut over the last several years, uh, beginning with Senator Austin, has every year submitted some type of tax idea to solve this problem because it doesn't serve us either, okay? So the idea is, is a fixed number up to six megawatts, as in the UTC, is the right answer. What we were appalled to see, and I've been doing this for 15 years, the money was never supposed to go to the state. It was always supposed to go to the municipality, and it should that's part of the Green New Deal is to generate tax revenue for these towns, but it has to be reasonable. For example, I have no problem paying a fixed tax number on the solar equipment, but to change the zoning underneath that it sits on, all of a sudden you go from $5,000 to $50,000. That project is economically sunk. So historically, and I don't know why it changed with the OPM suggestion, is tax the solar equipment, on this codified fixed rate, leave the underlying real estate alone up to six megawatts. After that, no, the, none of the programs are built or designed to build anything bigger than that. That's when DEEP does a procurement and a very constructive conversation can be had between yourself and Commissioner Dykes to put a tax amount into the RFP so everybody who bids on it is subject to the tax on those larger projects. I think that's the most simple, direct way to solve the problem on larger issue, on larger projects. Thank you very much. All right. Seeing no other questions at this time, have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you. And I apologize for going over my time. That's Thank okay. You. Uh, we are going to go back in our schedule to Maria Weingarten. Ms. Weingarten, welcome. Make sure you're unmuted. There you go. Got it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, Honorable Chairs, Representative Kevris DeGraw, Senator Rahman, Ranking Members Rep Zulo, Senator Fazio, and members of the P&D Committee. My name is Maria Weingarten. I'm a resident of New Canaan, a realtor, a former auditor with PwC, and currently serve as a member of New Canaan's Board of Finance. I'm also one of the founders of CT169 Strong. I'm here as an individual citizen to speak in support of today's bill, HB 6394. I've submitted test, I will be submitting to testimony, I'm still editing. Um, so I will discuss some of the main points with you here. Uh, it's a short bill, only four lines, but it gets to the heart of the matter. We need a new approach to housing and development, an approach looking to partner with suburbs that receive less consideration for grants because they are not distressed. Most housing bills this session are an adversarial attack on suburbs with onerous zoning concepts from developer-backed lobbyists that will not improve overall affordability. In contrast to other bills, 
this funding would provide higher density development that is actually going to be real, that towns will undertake on their own, not just a TBD. Um, there are no threats such as cutting state discretionary funding, and it does not diminish local control in any way. The bill is a better path and equal footing for funding for all municipalities, not just the distressed ones. Suburbs are criticized for not creating adequate affordable housing. And with the majority of grants going to the largest cities, along with the housing voucher allocations, poverty can be concentrated in cities. And that's precisely why cities have, many of them, 10%, 31 of them have 10% exemption from A30G. I see this bill as an opportunity to help towns like New Canaan apply for seed money to build affordable a carrot, not stick approach to get towns to build like New Canaan is to achieve moratoriums to get relief from A30G. This could bring laser focused 100% town originated affordable development instead of as of right high density market value overdevelopment that the other bills are proposing. I'm happy to address what we have done in New York, in, I'm sorry, in New Canaan to develop 100% affordable in our town. And these affordable units are not gonna sunset as the developer inclusionary projects do. I can also share additional thoughts on the moratorium process or why A30G 10% calculations are unattainable to many towns. Um, so I think uh, the point being, please partner directly with towns instead of imposing these punitive sticks that I know we're gonna be seeing in the coming weeks um, in these other bills. Instead of fantasy builds and they were come, um, fair share bills, which do not consider transit at all, this bill allows towns to strategically address transit in their own individual needs. It allows stakeholder input while developing near transit without the onerous one size top down state mandates that may overwhelm local infrastructure and the environment and raise property taxes. And municipalities know best, fund them directly, do not pander to the housing advocates that are developer backed looking for only as a right development. So please support your three this minutes bill. Is up. Please summarize your testimony. And I'm done. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. As I'm sure you're aware, this is not the Committee of Cognizance for 830G, nor are we hearing the fair share bill. So um, just wanted to point that out. There are not concerns here. We're, we're focused on the uh, transit oriented development. Uh, any questions? Seeing none at this time, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, you too. Up next, we have uh, Mr. Jeremy Hoya. Jeremy, I, I probably am slaughtering that. I apologize. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon uh, to the distinguished members of the committee. Uh, my name is Pui Jeremy. I live in New Haven, and I serve as Director of Recovery for All. Uh, we are a statewide coalition bringing together more than 60 different community, faith, and labor organizations across Connecticut. Uh, we represent hundreds of thousands of residents from all walks of life. Um, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Recovery for All in support of House Bill 5868. Um, our regressive tax structure in Connecticut reflects and fuels the extreme racial, economic, and gender disparities that make Connecticut one of the most unequal states in the country. Uh, and furthermore, our regressive tax structure is one of the main reasons underlying the pattern of chronic disinvestment that has undermined our public programs and services for decades. Uh, the data confirms in shocking detail that Connecticut state tax structure is upside down, uh, the tax incidence analysis report that DRS released last year showed that an average wealthy family has an effective state and local tax rate of 7%, whereas an average working class family has an effective state and local tax rate of 26%. Um, uh, a report from the Economic Policy Institute last year showed that 69% of all for-profit corporations in Connecticut, including those with more than a billion dollars in taxable income, contribute nothing or next to nothing to the state. So that's the data for individuals and, and for-profit uh, corporations. And then there are the huge private nonprofit institutions of higher education that benefit from public services and boast massive endowments yet are not required to contribute a penny in taxes to fund our communities. Uh, so right now, um, we have hundreds of thousands of working people who are struggling to make ends meet um, in the same towns and cities where private universities are amassing billions of dollars in additional wealth and failing to pay taxes. Uh, consider Yale University in my hometown. Over the last few decades, Yale's endowment has ballooned to a whopping $42 billion. 
At the same time, over the last few decades, the public programs and services that New Haven residents rely on for our quality of life have suffered from chronic underfunding. If our city could require Yale to contribute more of what they owe, then we could invest tens of millions of dollars to fund our public schools and public libraries and public parks, fund safety net services uh, like mental health and addiction services and reentry services, and reduce taxes for foreign working class residents. Imagine what our communities would look like if wealthy private universities contributed more. All our residents would stand to benefit and so would the universities. Um, and so just to wrap up, if our communities are to survive and thrive in the 21st century, then we need a strong equitable revenue stream to fund public programs and services that will reduce our state's extreme inequities. Um, enabling our towns and cities to require wealthy private universities to contribute more from their enormous endowments um, through House Bill 5868 is one key step to make this future possible. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, does the committee have any questions? Uh, seeing none, uh, thank you again for your testimony. Uh, we will move on to Andrew Gearing the Safe Streets Coalition of New Haven, followed by Emily McAvoy. Is Andrew in the room? Uh, seeing not, we'll move on to Emily McAvoy, followed by Aaron Good. Emily? Hello. Good afternoon, honorable members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Emily McAvoy. I'm a resident of Middletown and an organizer with SEIU District 1199 New England, where I work with our public sector mental health care workers. I'm also part of Recovery for All, as you just heard from Puya, a statewide coalition fighting for a better future Connecticut for Connecticut, bringing together more than 60 community, faith, and labor organizations. Today, I'm testifying in strong support of House Bill 5868, an act authorizing municipalities to impose a tax on the endowment funds of private institutions of higher education. Taxing university endowment funds is a practical step towards fixing the revenue gap that results when their properties go untaxed, and I'd like to draw attention to how this issue affects Middletown with the presence of Wesleyan University. In 2017, Wesleyan began their pullout and closure of the Green Street Arts Center. Local kids and families watched as their art programs were shuttered, materials thrown out, after-school homework help, and instrument lessons ceased to exist. And the reason given was that Green Street was not financially sustainable. Not enough higher-income kids whose families could afford to pay for the programs on a sliding scale were participating. The university, university decided that an annual price tag of $500,000 to support primarily low-income local youth and families was too high. Wesleyan's finances paint a very different picture of what is possible, especially after the massive university endowment returns across the country in 2021. Wesleyan's endowment ballooned to over $1.67 billion. Despite the endowment by gr growing by almost 48% from the end of 2020 to the end of 2021, they decreased the total amount of the endowment they chose to spend by 1.5%. In that year, there was a $28 million gap between how much, the, how much of the endowment was spent and invested back into university operations and how much is permitted to be spent by the Uniform Prudent Management of Institutional Funds Act. So how much tax burden does Wesleyan impose on Middletown? If taxed in 2021, Wesleyan's total property tax liability would be over $17 million. This is 7.61% of the most recent Middletown city budget. At the state level, the taxpayers cover 77% of this through pilot. In 2021, this was over $13 million. But in addition to pilot from the state, Wesleyan would need to contribute almost $4 million in 2021 to meet the hypothetical tax liability. Aside from water, sewer, and permits, they currently contribute nothing to the city. President Michael Roth has repeatedly refused the investment of just $1 million into a voluntary community fund, saying that the university's financial aid program takes precedence. In the face of their inaction, local and state governments now have a responsibility to bring financial aid back to the people, not the far and few between admitted to universities like Wesleyan by imposing a tax. In a, face, a, a state where working people already face an undue tax burden, it's unconscionable that the taxpayers are footing the bill for universities on the local and state level. Every dollar of tax revenue we create should be thought of as precious. It is in Middletown, where our local youth service bureau is a leader in the state with its restorative 
youth arrest diversion program, but less than half of the suburban YSBs uh, has less than half the staff of suburban YSBs in Middlesex County. It's precious statewide in the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, where life-saving addiction services were cut at the start of the pandemic, and our members often have no choice but to report to work with dangerously low staffing levels. Why are universities- up, Please summarize your testimony. Thanks. Why are universities off the hook for contributing to the public good in the same ways working people do? What's great about HB 5868 is that it empowers uh, the local governments to manage these funds and therefore empowers the constituents to demand the futures they deserve. Um, endowment tax is a mere, bare minimum demand for public accountability, which places power back in the hands of the people and funds public universal education for families to enjoy. Thanks to Rep Chafee for introducing this important bill and to the committee for your time today. Thank you, Emily, for your uh, testimony. Does the committee have any questions? Uh, seeing none, thank you again, Emily, for uh, your uh, testimony. Uh, we will now move on to Aaron Good, followed by Jason Klein. Uh, Mr. Good, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to uh, voice my support for HB 5353 regarding traffic authorities, and I applaud the Hamden delegation for sponsoring it. The statute this bill seeks to modify dates back to 1949 when there were no bike lanes or Americans with Disabilities Act. That statute is convoluted, confusing, antiquated, and counterproductive to the state POCD and the Vision Zero goals enacted in Public Act 2128. The New Haven were fortunate to have many highly qualified police commissioners, including former state rep Mike Lawler, renowned law professors at Yale, former police chiefs. These are bona fide experts in criminal justice. They are not, by their own admission, experts in traffic engineering, road safety assessment, or the content of the manual on traffic, uniform traffic control devices. Not a single commissioner has attended a training at the Connecticut Transportation Institute. Not a single one has ever answered a question on traffic safety at his or her confirmation hearing for the simple reason that the police commission's auxiliary role as local traffic authority Mr. Good, are you still with us? I don't know if you can hear us. <laughs> okay, we will come back to you unless you pop back up. Up oh, there you are. We lost you for a second. Mr. Good, are you with okay, us? Okay, sorry, I'll continue. Serving on a police commission is a critically important function that should be laser focused on the hiring and promotion of good police officers and the firing of bad ones. Our police commission does not have the bandwidth to pass informed judgment at every meeting on the suitability of a bike lane on Whitney Avenue or the lowering of the speed limit on Elm Street, which in New Haven are common traffic authority agenda items. State law should be encouraging municipalities with the interest and means to establish independent traffic authorities comprised of members with genuine subject matter expertise, not discouraging or preventing that by mandating widely divergent responsibilities be placed under the purview of a single decision-making body. This is especially true at a time when we're experiencing an epidemic of traffic violence and fatalities unprecedented in the last 30 years. So I'd urge the committee to approve this bill directly benefiting Hamden and New Haven, also to enact formal training requirements for traffic authorities that would benefit all communities. I know there's legislation to that effect in the Transportation Committee. Perhaps the language of that bill could be combined with this bill because they're obviously complementary. Further suggestion, remove the arbitrary population cutoff. Any town should be permitted to establish an independent traffic authority subject to review by the Office of State Traffic Administration. Brief comment on 6805 solar panels. I know the Community Associations Institute always has negative comments about this. They make some valid points about clarifying liability, but CAI does not speak for all or most condo associations. I'm the vice president of my condo association. We had no issue with right to charge last year or, or with this bill. We regularly get inquiries from realtors about whether our bylaws or declarations allow solar panels because that's a criterion for an increasing number of prospective buyers. We recognize it's in our own best interest to allow, indeed, encourage clean energy. In fact, we'd love to see a legislative fix to enhance the eligibility of condos for shared solar under the SCEF program with a sub-metering carve-out. It's very low-hanging fruit for boosting solar deployment in our state. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Very thorough testimony. Uh, seeing no questions at this time, have a pleasant afternoon. Up next, we have Jason Klein, followed by Francis Pickering. Mr. Klein, good to see you. Great to see everyone. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the of the committee. Uh, Jay Klein, uh, zoning lawyer and Easton resident, um, here in support of House Bill 6556 concerning the publication of 
legal notices. I should say that I'm, you know, one of those people who looks forward to getting their physical hard copy uh, newspaper delivered every day and reading that paper. Uh, but I am in support of 6556. I think it's a important step in providing information to people uh, where they're looking for it already. This has a, a particular impact in the uh, land use uh, realm because uh, state law requires that local zoning boards publish notice of their public hearings and notice of their decisions in uh, local newspapers. The problem is, is that there are many communities, and I, I live in one of them, where there is no local newspaper. There is no print newspaper available uh, in the town of Easton. Uh, so it's unclear how communities like that can hold public hearings or make important land use decisions uh, without violating uh, state laws that require in-print publications. Uh, there are some small and mid-sized communities that have weekly publications. Um, however, zoning notices must meet strict statutory timelines. And because of that, uh, a, a weekly publication may have limited use uh, for a land use board. I think the timing of you know, your committee's consideration of this proposal is interesting. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Connecticut Appellate Court issued a, uh, a decision uh, uh, concerning the Planning and Zoning Commission of the Borough of Fenwick, where a local uh, zoning decision, a decision that was you know, thoughtfully deliberated upon by members of a local land use board, was overturned because of a notice defect, uh, because it was unclear to the court that there was any newspaper that had a substantial circulation in the borough of Fenwick uh, that, that would meet the current statutory requirement. Uh, as several folks have said already, you know, the, the whole point of notice standards is to make sure people are aware of important uh, uh, local matters. Uh, and this bill will help people uh, or, or allow municipalities to provide information where folks are already looking for it for it today. Uh, so uh, that's all I have to say on this uh, Friday afternoon. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, but hope that you'll support this proposal. Thank you so much, Mr. Klein. I am seeing no questions at this time. Have a great weekend. Happy Friday. Take care. Thanks. Francis, you're up. Followed by Betsy Gara. Good afternoon, distinguished members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Francis Pickering. I'm the Executive Director of the Western Connecticut Council of Governments, representing 18 municipalities and a population of 620,000 persons. I am here today to speak in favor of proposed bill 6394 and act concerning incentives for transit oriented development. We strongly support this bill. What this bill would do is allow uh, grant applications to state programs from municipalities that have train stations to receive a preference or priority and reduce sto a state, um, an increased state funding amount or reduce local cost share if those projects are within one half mile of a transit station, and that they also result in a more uh, denser housing or more affordable housing. This is consistent with the state definition of transit-oriented development that is already in state law. The way it would do this is by qualifying those projects uh, with the same status as if they came from a distressed municipality, which is a DECD designation. Under uh, many state laws, applications from distressed municipalities uh, qualify for a higher cost state share uh, these include for housing creation, economic development, including brownfields remediation, infrastructure, which also includes wastewater, mobility, public space, and broadband. The purpose of this law is to work around, uh, this bill is to work around a problem in state law, namely that uh, the state, in contrast with best practices and with federal agencies, uh, only recognizes distress at the municipal level. It does not recognize that we have parts of towns that are on the wrong side of the tracks. And in fact, we uh, established that in state law saying, yeah, it's only looked at in the aggregate. Uh, many of our municipalities have good parts of town and so-called bad parts of town, and state law does not address them right now. What this essentially would do is what many housing advocates are calling for, which is direct resources to municipalities that do not qualify as distressed, but have areas that are distressed that can support affordable housing because you don't need a car to live there. And it would enable those projects to go forward. So the mills and factories we see littering our state, the brownfields we see around our states, the incomplete sewer systems, it would provide funding to actually build housing at those locations, and it would actually do so following local plans. So in Western Connecticut, uh, we have a lot of pressure for development. We have 10 transit-oriented development plans in our region, uh, the vast majority of which have not been implemented because we don't have the resources to do so. And the problem is at the state level, the state says, well, your residents tend to have higher than average income, so your town is not distressed, therefore you don't qualify. Well, anybody who's been to Georgetown can see that place is a, is a disaster. Reading has 10 thousand people. 
Yes, they may have higher incomes than Waterbury residents, but Waterbury has much more organizational capacity actually to rehabilitate a brownfield and to build transit-oriented development. So we are here uh, in strong support of this bill. I'm also happy to answer any questions about uh, how the distressed municipality designation actually is constructed, uh, but we think this is a, a great path forward to work with municipalities to help realize locally supported projects that build diverse, vibrant, and sustainable communities across the state. Thank you so much. Uh, Rep. Michel. I couldn't hear the last uh, part of your testimony when you mentioned that you, you, you'd be happy to answer certain questions on Oh, on uh, the, the concept of distressed municipalities. So some of the testimony submitted today expresses concern that this would represent a shift of funding or adding more competition to the pool against existing distressed municipalities. Um, DECD uh, maintains a list of 25 so-called distressed municipalities based on aggregate statistics, so calculated at the municipal level. It's arbitrarily capped at 25. The parameters for this are set in state law. However, DECD go goes above and beyond state law by adding additional variables and weighting them in ways that are not set in state law. And it results in some um, somewhat interesting outcomes. So for instance, uh, with uh, no disrespect to Bob Carlson, who was here earlier today from North Stonington, North Stonington is uh, considered a distressed municipality, uh, even though the median household income there is $85,000. They only have 300 residents who fall below the federal poverty line. Those residents are 85% white, by the way. New Haven, in contrast, where the median household income is $49,000, they have over 32,000 residents below the federal poverty line. And those residents are 37% white, by the way, is not considered distressed. So we, we are sensitive to considerations about bringing more competition uh, into the pool for additional state funds. But the reality is we have pockets of distress all around our state. And if you drive through our communities, those tend to be where our train stations are, because those are the areas that developed historic in the 19th century, where there was industry, where there was higher density housing, which has become dilapidated. And the industrial properties now present brownfields that are horrendously expensive to rehabilitate, uh, far beyond the capacity of all but a very few municipalities. And we think uh, one way to advance redeveloping these areas and bring more affordable housing into communities that may otherwise not be distressed but have distressed pockets is to let projects in those areas that actually build housing there qualify as distressed for programs that would uh, facilitate that housing construction. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Pickering. Senator Fazio. Thank you, Mr. Pickering, for your input. Um, you know, this strikes me as um, a simple but a positive proposal because, first of all, it gets at something that um, you know a lot of advocates have uh, have been supportive of the past couple of years. It's become in vogue, which is transit-oriented development, um, perhaps because uh, um, because if you're near a transit station, it alleviates some of the financial burdens for transportation, and also because there's a positive environmental aspect of it. So uh, this is perhaps a less onerous way um, than, than some of the other proposals we've seen in recent years that um, would penalize municipalities or take away some of their local flexibility in order to promote uh, transit-oriented uh, development, so to speak. And um, secondly, I think it also gets at something that we haven't discussed enough in the whole housing discussion and discourse in recent years, which is that um, we should make sure that the money is following uh, the individuals we're trying to help as much as possible. And um, by equalizing the funding per project, um, not treating necessarily uh, in an arbitrary way one municipality differently than the other, um, we actually could help the most people. Um, because it doesn't necessarily matter where, um, what municipality they live in, uh, we want to create housing for people who need it, and we want to do it in a, um, in a sustainable way. And so this strikes me as a pretty simple um, but agreeable way of, of getting at those two problems. Um, so I, I do appreciate your, your feedback and your testimony in support of it. And if I may just respond to that, and it's it's also consistent with the way the federal government, federal agencies address things. 
I'm not aware of a single federal program that looks at the stress on a municipal basis. It's always a census tract or even uh, more granular than that. Uh, so this is consistent with that. And with respect to your comments about uh, affordability and transportation, um, we set a threshold of about 30% for what's considered of, of, of household income, what's uh, considered the maximum housing burden. We often forget transportation. Uh, transportation for most households costs half as much as their housing does. Uh, for lower income households, it's about 20% of their incomes. So if we can situate housing by transit stations um, and do so in a way that is locally driven where we already have plans, we don't get into litigation and fights with municipalities because that just fritters away money and time and creates bad will. But we actually do it in ways, implement the plans we already have. We can take a unit that's affordable 100% of area or state median income, and it becomes affordable at 80% if they don't have to have a car. It's incredibly powerful to do transit-oriented development. And what I'm asking here is, you know, instead of um, taking, instead of having our state funding programs prioritize uh, building more affordable housing in our cities, which is a very important need, um, let's also add to the priority list building around our train stations. And that will help spread uh, economic opportunity around households and also help households have more uh, flexibility in their own locational decisions. Okay, I think um, uh, Representative Bumgarner. So how, how do we do just that in with this bill? So what this bill does is essentially say uh, for the state programs that fund brownfield remediation, which we know that's a huge problem for redeveloping old industrial sites, uh, such as factories or mills, or uh, doing sewer uh, line extensions or extra capacity, uh, building sidewalks, public parks, and affordable housing, this bill would actually say um, areas around train stations would uh, have a leg up in these funding programs. They'd have priority, and they would have uh, a reduced local cost share. And so many of these things, these infrastructure and environmental questions are so expensive that what matters is not so much the income of people somewhere else in town, it's the total cost of the project. And frankly, the, the state is the big brother who can come in and help the little brothers and sisters actually uh, redevelop these areas into really equitable, vibrant, transit-oriented communities. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, have a great afternoon. Thank you. And bringing it home, we have Betsy Gara. Thank you, Representative Cavros de Gras, members of the committee. My name is Betsy Guerra. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns, and I'm here to testify on several bills, and I'll do so very briefly. Uh, first up, our top priority, one of our top priorities this session is House Bill 6556, which would eliminate the mandate that towns publish legal notices and print newspapers as opposed to on municipal websites. I think that this is long overdue and I'm hopeful that we can move this bill out of committee and into the house for a full vote. Um, although it's not a huge cost for many of our small towns, it's a growing cost and it's also an unnecessary cost. And I think that's why it's so frustrating. In addition, it also takes a lot of time in order to prepare the notices for the print publications. Sometimes there's errors as others have testified. So uh, I, I do think it's time to eliminate that. People are accustomed to getting their information on the municipal websites or through emails that they sign up from from the town or on social media platforms. I was a little surprised that the newspaper advocates uh, raised the issue of authentication because towns and town clerks authenticate documents on a daily basis. There's nobody that is paying more attention to ensure the integrity of a document than our towns because they recognize that it can jeopardize the compliance issues, it can jeopardize moving ahead with projects if they fail to provide certain notices in a timely manner. Also, the judicial branch and the state agencies have moved forward publishing notices on agency and the judicial branch's websites without any issues of authentication. So I don't think that's a, a, a real valid concern. And I do hope, again, that we can move this bill out of the committee this year. Um, I also want to testify briefly in support of Senate Bill 506 and 519, which are trying to address a, a loophole that has negatively impacted property tax collection in certain areas with respect to solar arrays. And I know there's been a lot of discussion about this, uh, where there's uh, solar developers that have somehow gamed the system by 
putting solar arrays, smaller solar arrays side by side on one parcel, or using separately metered systems to avoid property tax patient taxation. I was heartened to hear that it's a limited issue. And that's my experience that we're only hearing from a handful of towns that this has been a problem. But, and I'm also heartened to hear that the solar industry would be willing to work with the municipalities to ensure that this does not occur. But I do think it's important to tighten up the law to prevent this from happening again, because for those communities, it has resulted in a substantial loss of revenue. And we also support House Bill 6293 regarding the solar farm issues, um, ensuring that the installation of the solar arrays, that they pay attention, that the Connecticut Siting Council pays attention to local land use laws, to local plans of conservation and development, because those laws are balanced to ensure that development also um, protects the setbacks and environmentally sensitive lands like aquifer protection areas, which seem to be being ignored by the Connecticut Siting Council in approving the siting of various large solar farm installations. So we support that bill and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. To the point of, of your la the last bill you testified on, would it be maybe more advantageous to uh, put a further regulation or something on the siting council to get at the heart of what this issue is in terms of them looking at the plans and and site you know having more more forethought to the projects going into these towns i think that would be a good approach in fact there have been bills in the past and i believe there's a bill this session before the environment committee that would require the connecticut siting council to consider the impact on on certain environmentally sensitive lands, whether it be public water supply, watershed lands, and making sure that the Department of Public Health uh, can weigh in on what the impact would be on the water quality or something to that effect. So I do think there's a way to approach it where you're not tasking the siting council with looking at each and every planning and zoning uh, laws and regulations or every local plan of conservation and development, um, but just to make sure that those things are being considered, because a lot of these projects have been narrowly rejected because uh, one member wasn't available or one member resigned prior to the vote, and so they were defeated on a split vote, but I, I, I agree with your um, approach. I think that would be helpful. Okay, thank you very much. I am seeing no other questions at this time, and we do have one more testifier. Uh, Leslie Blatteau, who was earlier on our schedule, is here now. Go ahead, well, Ms. Blatteau. Thanks so much. Um, appreciate you making the time. Um, uh, good afternoon, chairs and members of the Planning and Development Committee. My name is Leslie Blatteau. I'm a teacher, parent, and resident in New Haven. I'm the president of the New Haven Federation of Teachers and an at-large vice president of AFT Connecticut. And we also belong to the Recovery for All Coalition a statewide group fighting for a better future for Connecticut. I'm testifying this afternoon in strong support of House Bill 5868, an act authorizing municipalities to impose a tax on the endowment funds of private institutions of higher ed. As the wealthiest state in Connecticut, pardon me, as the wealthiest state in the country, Connecticut should be an example for the nation where every family has what we need to live a good life. But instead, we have a state where hundreds of thousands of working people are struggling even while private universities are adding billions to their endowment and failing to pay what they owe in taxes. If a city like New Haven could tax Yale's $42.3 billion endowment, we could invest $190 million to meet the needs of New Haven children and families and make our city an even more vibrant place to live and work. If Yale paid what they owe, we could reduce property tax burden on renters and homeowners. We could reduce class size and address the teacher shortage in our public schools. We could make sure every public school student has a full-time nurse in their school, a school librarian, school social workers, and college counselors. We could fully staff special ed. We could fully staff and provide support for our English language learners. And we could offer free ESL classes and GED classes to adults. As a longtime teacher and now a union leader and public school parent in New Haven, I know the impact of the teacher shortage. The scale of this crisis demands a bold response, and Connecticut has a responsibility to step in here because we know that universities like Yale are reporting record profits. During the pandemic, while families were struggling, Yale recorded a 40% rate of return on their endowment. 
And despite this unprecedented wealth, Yale does not pay taxes toward the city of New Haven. I recognize they pay pilots, but that is voluntary and it's only a small percentage of what they should be paying. And really the money that Yale should be paying should be democratically allotted. It should not be decided by decision makers at the university. The constituents of New Haven should have the right to determine where that tax revenue goes. Um, and lastly, I would just like to add that, you know, I want to imagine a New Haven where resources are plentiful and it's not a city um, where Yale has plenty and the rest of the city does not. So, you know, if, if we were to imagine what that what those taxes could go to, we could reduce class size in half if we had one hundred and forty million dollars a year from from this uh, proposed legislation. We could build close to a thousand more units of affordable housing. We could put over 10,000 young children into critically needed childcare. We your could reduce our milk. Please summarize your testimony. We could fix the potholes. I will end by saying this is an unprecedented opportunity to make sure that people in New Haven and throughout the state have what they need. I urge the committee to have the courage to make the right choice and pass this legislation, uh, House Bill 5868. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. I am seeing no questions at this time. Thank you for your testimony. That concludes our public hearing for today, March 3rd. Uh, it is now 2.37. And our next meeting, I guess our next public hearing we're thinking is going to be next Friday at 11 a.m. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great weekend.